members, we have quorum. We get started. Are you good? Hmm? What about it? Ready? Excellent. No worries. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to meeting number 31 of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, welcoming members of the committee. I see no non-members of the committee here at this time. And of course, um, We'd like to welcome all the members of the pu public that are here with us this morning. Uh, for those of you who are in the room with us, there is a screen at the back to most of you, your left and my right, it's the far right there. Um, this screen in, that provides real-time update uh, where you're able to take a look to see what agenda item is coming up next. You can track um, the activities of the committee there. And for those uh, members of the uh, city or the public as such or who are following this debate on their computers, laptops, and smartphones, they, uh, who are interested in doing so can visit us at www.toronto.ca uh, backslash council. The Economic Development Committee is um, very grateful and acknowledges that uh, this meeting is taking place on the traditional territories of the Mississauga, of the new first new credit of the First Nation, and the Haudenosaunee and the um, Huron Wundat, and uh, the, they, this land has been home to many diverse uh, and indigenous people for a very long time, and so I welcome all to our final meeting of the term 2014-2018 uh, and I just want to say before I proceed that uh, the members that have been part of this committee and Councillor Hart you have been a late addition 
Uh, also from Scarborough, and Councillor Kelly reminded me that although this isn't the Scarborough Committee, that Councillor Grimes and Councillor Frakadakis is uh, welcome to be members of Scarborough Community Council anytime they wish. Uh, and see Councillor, all in favor, <laughs> that carries, thank you. I, I really want to thank you all for uh, being here and being on time as we are ready to go. We have a number of items on the agenda this morning. We have a number of speakers on uh, items uh, uh, 31.3, 31.7, and I think we have one on eight as well. So let me just go through the vetting of the agendas, members, and you can hold whichever items that you um, you like. So, are there any uh, declaration of um, interest on the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of the June 11th uh, meeting. Councillor Grimes, all those in favor, oppose, that carries. Thank you very much. Are there any specific presentations? Communications? Yes, there's a bunch of communications on the Okay, so we have some communications that are on your desk, members. I invite you to take a, um, a quick uh, glance and uh, read at your leisure. Um, okay, moving forward. Um, the first item that we have, which will be a presentation, it is uh, ED31.1. It's the Greater Toronto Airport Authority update, and we'll be hearing from the chairman, Mr. David Wilson, uh, who is accompanied by Ms. Laurie McKee, who is a director of uh, public affairs for the GTA, and I will basically get back to that in a moment, so we'll just hold that item down. Uh, ED31.2, Economic Development Committee, is the chairman's remark for the period of um, 2011 to 2018, it's the review for the period. Uh, ED 31.3, de ascensioning and transfer of the City of Toronto's Lancaster bombers. Uh, we have a number of speakers on that particular item, so we'll be holding that down for um, speaking that will come later. ED 31.3. Point four, Asia, Japan, and China Mission 2018. Councillor Kelly is moving receipt. All those. Yeah. Councillor Kelly. One observation. Uh, Asia, Japan, two, three. Yes. The city of Toronto has a long history of development and developing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in 86, the relationship with Chongqing, China was initiated by the City of Toronto, and I'm wondering if that was Metro. And I've noticed in a number of reports that uh, things that were done by the previous metropolitan government have been attributed to the City of Toronto. And as we all know, there was a big difference. So this is an uh, observation in your That's point coming out to our staff. Uh, Ms. Williams, did you wish to comment on that, or did you just want to just let that go? No, I think we're, <clears throat> we'll come back and correct it for uh, uh, the record if we're wrong, if we could do that. Okay. So, so no, motion no to No criticism amend. of the trip, first rate. Good. Because I know <clears throat> I know in Sagamahar's case, it was a relationship Harbor. with Scarborough. Yes. So, um, so um, this move for Councillor Kelly, no, actually, I think in order to recognize your point, because it's a very valid point, because now we just commingle everything we say, it's all the city of Toronto, but you're right, there was a history before this amalgamated uh, uh, government, if you will. What I'd like to do, Councillor Kelly, if, if, with your permission, is just to hold this down, and we can actually work on some wording, just to amend it, to reflect that concern, so that moving forward, we would reflect that, uh, that type of recognition in our reporting. Uh, Councillor, just give me one second, so we will, do that if we can. So, Councillor Rackadakis. Sorry, I was just wondering if there, if that is found to be incorrect, um, can they not just um, revise the report with those corrections, which is what we did at Toronto East York Community Council last week, where some uh, there was some information that was inaccurate in certain reports, and staff just revised the report, and then that is the report that went online as well, and it was that updated. makes that makes a lot of sense, Councillor. And so, what I'd like to do is just um, let, let's just hold this down for a moment, and we'll just um, concur confer with the staff so that we can actually do that. Then it makes a whole lot of sense, actually. Okay. Thanks very much for your suggestion, Councillor Kelly. Are you satisfied with that? 
Yep. Okay, fantastic. Let's just hold this down then for a moment so that we could um, decide on the undertaking in terms of how to make those changes which would minimize, um, you know, any um, impact with respect to the report without having to amend it as such. All right, so we're holding uh, ED 3.4 in order to make those changes. Uh, ED 31.5, Los Angeles uh, Mission 2018. What say you members? Councilor Grimes is moving uh, the item. Uh, all those in favor? Oppose, that's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Kelly. Thank you. Um, all right, so moving ahead, we are at uh, ED 31.6. Uh, that's request for attendance uh, at the Film Board's uh, Customer Service Enhancement uh, Working Group. What's your members? Yeah. Councilor Frank, could I ask you moving adoption? Yeah. Okay, all those in favor? Oppose, that's carried, thank you. ED 31.7, Imagination, Manufacturing, Innovation, Technology, the IMET, Property Tax Incentive Program application. It came in uh, supplementary material. I hope members had actually seen that and had a chance to read it. Um, we will be holding that down. We have a number of speakers who wish to speak on that particular item. ED 31.8, authority to receive funds to increase awareness and to take up of the Canada Learning Bond in Toronto. What say you, member? There's a speaker. There was a speaker. On this. Oh, that's all right. There's number eight, Mr. Moran, Moran is speaking on that. So we will hold that item down. Thank you. Uh, ED 31.9, appointments to Business Improvement Area Board of Management, Councillor Grimes. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. ED 31.10, that's, pardon me? Okay, I was gonna hold that myself. Re uh, renewing uh, Canada's Walk of uh, Fame as a celebration and desperate destination. Well, I'll hold that in the name of Councillor Kelly and we'll deal this with later on. Okay, uh, ED 31.11, Toronto's Economic Bulletin. Councillor Grimes? Councilor Grimes is moving the item. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Okay, thank you very much. We will now, members, move to the top of the agenda. And we would like to ask a uh, representative from the GTAA, Greater Toronto Airport Authority, Mr. David Wilson, Chairman of the Board of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, and Laurie McKee, Director of Public Affairs, um, Greater Toronto Airport Authority. Uh, they are no strangers to this committee. Mr. Wilson, Ms. McKee, welcome back. Good Let me morning, know when you're ready, I'll start your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Chairman Thompson and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for your time to allow me and my colleague, Laurie McKee, on my left here, to provide you with an update on Toronto Pearson's activities and initiatives during the past year. Uh, Councillor Thompson, I particularly want to thank you for your ongoing keen interest and support of Toronto Pearson. We do notice it and appreciate it. T today is our annual update to share a, an overview of our 2018 priorities and activities as well as the 2017 year-end results. Our last presentation to this committee was September 2017. As Chair of the Board of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority and the City of Toronto's nominee on that board, I am pleased to report that Toronto Pearson continues to see growth of 6 to 8 percent per year, which meant we, we welcomed more than 47 million passengers to the airport last year. In each of the last three years, we have added the equivalent of one Ottawa airport to Toronto Pearson. That's 3 million more people each year. We expect to hit 50 million passengers passing through the airport in 2018. It's important to note, however, that the number of planes is not growing at this same rate. As the planes at Toronto Pearson are getting larger and fuller, we're seeing the number of planes grow at a more modest 1.5 percent. The airport's growth is simply a reflection of the health of our economy and the attractiveness of this city and this region as a place to invest in, trade and visit. 
The board of the, of the airport continues to be focused on financial sustainability, efficient operations, and ensuring that we're making smart investments in infrastructure, services, and amenities to meet this growing passenger demand. We have a short presentation, uh, which I'll ask Laurie to lead, following which we'll be pleased to answer any of the councillors' questions. Laurie. Great. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thanks for having us here this, today. As David says, the growth of the airport does continue to grow. Uh, at the end of last year, we issued a master plan for Toronto Pearson that was approved by Minister Garneau, and it shows that we will continue to see the growth in passenger traffic over the next uh, 10 years, and we expect Pearson's uh, ultimate capacity to be around 85 million passengers. The strength of a, a global airport like Toronto Pearson really does rest on its ability to connect directly to other major economies. Uh, the last time we were here, we reported that we could reach 67% of the world's economy with direct flights. I'm pleased to say that that's increased to 70%. That helps to flow uh, in local investments, local head office location uh, decisions, and trade. And we saw that very clearly in the Amazon bid, where uh, some of the key features of what Amazon is looking for is direct connections to the cities that matter to their business. We were very uh, pleased to also be able to support the bid for the FIFA 2026. And now that we've been successful, we're very much looking forward to working with the city and other partners on hosting that. Airports do generate lots of jobs. Um, Pearson's no different. There's 49,000 people that work inside the fence at the airport, and 5,000 of those are residents of the City of Toronto. There's also spin-off uh, catalytic benefits that an airport has when you connect economies through flight and the movement of goods and people. That generates, through Pearson, about 300,000 jobs, and about 60,000 of those uh, can be attributed back to the City of Toronto. We spend a significant amount of money each year in terms of supporting the operations at the airport. There's about 150 million worth in procurement that happens at the airport uh, in companies located in the city of Toronto. Companies that you know well, like Payball, Black and McDonald, um, Tyson Croup, and Indigo Park. As we grow, we know we need to make sure that we're managing the impacts that we have on our neighbors. Uh, we issued late last year a, a five-year noise management action plan. This was updating the previous five-year plan. And it takes a real balanced approach to how we uh, operate the airport and try to minimize the impacts that we have. And that report contains 10 actionable commitments that we make uh, to our communities about the things we'll be doing in that five-year plan to minimize the impacts that we have. There's also six ideas that were generated through community engagement that are starting to be implemented now. And they are um, ideas that have come forward from residents, uh, independent experts. Uh, one of the commitments is to have a quiet fleet incentive program. This one has a particular uh, retrofit to the A320 aircraft. It's been recommended by experts. Community has spoken uh, very positively about it. Minister Garneau, Air Canada, our largest partner, is also uh, looking forward to the retrofitting of those planes that will actually have a, a, a tangible impact on the noise that an aircraft makes at source. Among the six ideas, there's one that we'll be testing later this July, and it involves alternating the use of our east-west runways so that in summer weekends, there's opportunities for some communities to have uh, scheduled respite from noise. It's uh, a tactic that's used at other major airports around the world, Heathrow, for example, and it's been very successful, so we're going to test it out starting at the end of July through uh, eight weekends into September. We spend time also thinking about how we continue to move passengers and goods through the airport as efficiently as the numbers continue to grow with three million passengers each year. We need to be working using technology and processes to improve that flow. Uh, and so the passenger amenities through uh, CATSA, which is the pre-board screening and new technology to s support the movement of people through that. You can see on the right-hand side, the Mayor and Councillor Cole were out to support the launch of YYZ Live. So between June and December, we'll be hosting uh, 75 bands um, that are playing free concerts to, to help to bring up that atmosphere in the airport as people go through. 
We also spend time thinking about the impacts that we have by trying to give back in our community. We have a target of being a, an Imagine Canada company, which is investing 1% of our net profits to support community-based initiatives. Two programs within the City of Toronto, one is the STEM program, which is supporting about 38,000 GTA youth, uh, and that's 600,000 over three years. That program was launched in Ward 1 with Councillor Crisanti. We're also working uh, to uh, invest in Mabel Arts, which is transporting, forming uh, city parks that are in neglect and making them more community cultural spaces. As population continues to grow, the aviation demand keeps growing. So while Pearson looks like we'll have about 85 as our capacity, uh, Southern Ontario's ultimate demand for aviation, looking forward to about 2037, is for about 110 million passengers to be, or be looking to fly through the region. So we need to be thinking about how that growth can be handled going forward. Congestion is a significant challenge for us in the region and in the city. It uh, is ever present for us in the northwest corner of the city around the airport. So the, the desire for the airport to spend some time and effort in investing in a transit, transit centre at the airport has been something we've been talking about for a couple of years now. Uh, the airport area is the second largest employment zone in Canada. Downtown Toronto is number one, we're two. Uh, and so there's a million car trips a day that are travelling into that area and only 10% of those are by public transit. So it's a problem that we've taken to heart and one we're looking to, to play a role in, in, in solving. Uh, we've made a commitment to build a new passenger processing facility to accommodate the demand for travel. And in conjunction with that, uh, building the facility in such a way that it can accommodate the various transit lines. Union Station uh, serves a significant role from a ground transportation perspective, but if you look at cities like Chicago and uh, New York, those cities when they were our size had two major transit hubs. So we're suggesting that we need another hub akin to that and that it be located uh, uh, near Toronto Pearson and, and actually attach your ground hub to your air hub. Many cities around the world have done this. Heathrow, Schiphol, Hong Kong, for example. Um, you may have noticed an ad campaign that we are running just trying to raise the level of attention and need for more connectivity from ground transportation. This summer it's really focused on bus connections which we think, see as that first opportunity to grow in the next five years and then ultimately through light rail and other connections. Across the region we're working with other airports. As I said the demand for travel is about 110 million passengers with Pearson looking to have a capacity of about 85. Other airports will need to play uh, roles to support that aviation demand. So from Windsor through to, uh, to Kingston up to Lake Simcoe, we've been working with other airports and how we can work together to serve that demand going forward. So that's the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention and we'd happily take any of your questions. Thank you very much, um, David and Lori. Uh, questions? Okay. Councillor Hart to begin. That's just picking up on your last slide. At, at what point do we need another airport in the GTA? So the, you're speaking about Pickering, I would assume. Yes. So those lands are owned by the federal government and it's, really, it's ultimately up to the government of Canada to make a decision. Uh, as I said, the growth continues for aviation as population grows, that spurs demand for aviation. Um, that call will be made by the federal government. There was studies that were done some time ago that showed a potential need for a future airport around 2027. Um, the government of Canada has been doing additional study on that and they'll be putting a report out in some time to come, I'm told. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hart. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Laurie, David, number one, thank you very much for your support of the 26, 26 feet of bid. I know it was uh, under tight timelines, but thank you for uh, Helping us get that get that in and successful bid. Um, I was dealing with Hillary Marshall, I guess, um, on when the east-west runway was closed. There's going to be a little miscommunication with the community. Um, what are we going to do to uh, alleviate that in the future? Because it was a big outcry from Etobicoke, Mississauga. I know some groups have now formed out of that, the CASS and these groups. So how are we going to communicate with these groups better? You're, yeah, you're talking about the runway construction that we did in 2017 and we operated in the north-south much more frequently than we had anticipated and so some communities were caught off guard by that. Um, we did actually have runway rehabilitation this past summer 
and we didn't see the same uh, reaction from community because we did significantly more communication, uh, reaching out, talking to communities so they understood what was coming. Uh, just like the roads in the city, we do have to maintain our aviation infrastructure on the air side, runways and taxiways. And so it's an ongoing capital program that will happen uh, every couple years with five runways. Uh, but I think with good communication, we can make sure that communities understand uh, what's going to happen when, what the impacts may be, and they understand you know, that it will be will end as well and we'll go back to normal operations. It'll be part of that stem, 10 step plan you're talking about about being involved? Communication is definitely a part of our noise management action plan to make sure that we're communicating in better ways. Great, thanks Laurie. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Grimes. Councillor Kelly. Thank you. 47 million passengers, uh, where does that place us in the, uh, the hierarchy of um, airports around the world? Like a Tenth. So in, in North America, we're about 10th to 12th okay. right, on the season, yeah. And rising rapidly? Uh, we are. We're one of the fastest growing airports in the world. By what percentage? Our annual percentage growth has been about 6 to 8%. I read a book uh, in 94 when I returned to public life. Uh, I can't remember the title or the author, but the argument was that airports were going to be the the going forward, we're going to be the uh, economic engines uh, and the new downtowns, in quotation marks, mm -hmm. uh, of the future. And it, that argument has been vividly illustrated by the success of the airport. Um, do you think the uh, NAFTA um, issues will have any impact on the growth? Yeah, the long-range planning that the board of the airport has seen indicates that uh, we don't we haven't adjusted any of our forecasts for any any negative NAFTA impacts. So we don't really factor that into the, into the, into what's happening now. There's too much uncertainty as to how it might actually all land the NAFTA negotiations. I mean, so we haven't adjusted our outlook or our, our capital plans at all, Councillor. The reason I ask that is that the volume of traffic or the the value of the traffic that you attract is not only just passenger traffic, it's commercial, uh, industrial uh, traffic. What percentage of your income comes from that other side of the business? So the volume of cargo that we have is about 450,000 tonnes per year. Um, most of it comes in passenger aircraft and we show that rising to about 600,000 tonnes um, in the next 20 years. Um, you know the revenue? I don't have the revenue number off the top of my head. Right. It's a, grow, it's a growing part of what the airport does is, is the cargo business, Councillor. Does Amazon play any role in the growth of uh, that side of the business? The landing fees that we charge to an airline, it doesn't matter how many people are on the plane or how much cargo is in the underbelly. The, the landing fee is calculated on the manufactured weight of the aircraft, and so it doesn't make a difference from that perspective in terms of our, the revenues that we collect per plane. Yeah. But your question was about Amazon? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the counselor's question was whether Amazon has an impact on our cargo activities. Amazon, it potentially does. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, a lot of the Amazon goods are smaller, and so they may be more the FedEx, uh, UPS type movement as opposed to the underbelly of uh, passenger aircraft. My last question is with respect to the uh, the rail connection between downtown Toronto and the airport. Um, um, I sat on the the last board of uh, the Harbour Commission, uh, and at that time we made we made the decision to uh, reintroduce the uh, airport uh, on the island. Um, we, um, at that time, were a bit worried about the impact that the uh, a rail connection would have on that island airport, but it, it would appear that um, when you look at the growth of the of, uh, Billy Bishop Airport, uh, it would appear that the rail line has not had a negative effect. But I'm wondering if it's delivered the passenger volume that had been anticipated when it was built or when it was conceived, the idea was conceived and after it was built. 
I mean, part of the objective of the of Up Express was to get cars off the road and people into the train, and I think the train has become much busier than it initially was. Do you have numbers on the usage of the Up Express, Lori? Yeah, I think there's somewhere in the order of 4,000 passengers per day. Um, we hear more now about complaints about getting a seat because it's very, very busy. Um, one of the things about airports is all airports need good ground connectivity, so the island, Pearson, Waterloo, and then the map that's still on the screen starts to show how we need to also start to think about how you connect airports as well so that you can you know, move around the region to, to make connections to a regional flight or an international flight out of Pearson. Um, the other role that the, the Up Express is playing is it, it's playing a role for passengers traveling not to the airport at all. I mean, the, the, the day of, uh, of a Blue Jays game, you'll see lots of Blue Jays shirts uh, on the train because people have stopped and parked and caught the train at Pearson and to get their trip downtown. And so it's really playing a commuter role that way. If you had to guess. Yes, sir. Oh, that's fine. I'll give you a last question. That's fine. If you had to guess, what percentage of that uh, passenger volume on that line would be subway, subway style uh, traffic? Non-air non -air passenger traffic? Can you Lori, any idea? I don't have the split. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? I don't have the split to know how many are sort of commuters versus air passengers. The employees of the airport, 49,000 people, a lot of them use it as well. So it's. Yeah. That's airport connected, not necessarily passengers. Okay. We know that employees and passengers uh, taking transit is around 10%. Now that would also include the Lawrence bus and the airport rocket TTC and other transit, including the Up Express. So it's only about 10%. So it's a pretty small number of passengers and employees that take public transit to get to the airport. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Councillor Frakadakis. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. So I was just looking at your slide deck. Um, and I guess on your first slide, it talked about the number of passengers that came into Pearson last year. And the next slide talks about economic growth that's driving the air travel. I'm just wondering, do you have a split that says how many people are actually coming in? It's like a weird echo. Craig, it's a bit of an echo coming. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering if you had a split of how many people were here uh, for uh, pleasure, not work, and how many people were here for business of the 47 million? Mm -hmm. We actually don't track it that way because people would have to sort of self-identify themselves in terms of what, what they're traveling for, so we don't have a leisure number. Well, the, we ac they actually do, if they're coming into the country, identify on their immigration form, so I, you don't have access. Yeah, but a third of, a third of our passengers are domestic. Right, okay. Um, so uh, just to follow up on another uh, conversation, when um, I think it was Councillor Kelly was asking uh, Mr. Wilson about um, the Up Express. So in Boston, they have a, a shuttle that goes from Logan Airport into the downtown, and it's actually free because they actually are trying to really encourage less vehicular traffic in and out of their airport. I was wondering, I realize that the Up Express has been reduced significantly to like, what, $12 per ride on your way from Pearson to um, Union Station. However, I was wondering if there was any conversation or any thinking going into trying to make it free for people going from the airport to the downtown to encourage less cars and in an attempt to deal with all of the congestion that we have on our roads and on our highways in the spirit of what they're doing in Boston to alleviate traffic. Yeah, Metrolinx <laughs> that sets the fares for Up Express, not the airport. Have there been any conversations with Metrolinx, Lori, about? Uh... There are some conversations about doing different promotions and uh, some ideas around certain events where you try and offer uh, some sort of reduced amount, but uh, really, it's as David mentioned, it's Metrolinx that sets that fare, not the GTA. Or anyone else other than Metrolinx in an attempt to encourage, because the shuttle doesn't actually have to be the UP Express, it could be something else. Sure. I mean, there are examples of businesses that have come together to run shuttles. The, the airport corporate center lands that are just due south of us, um, bunch, a group of businesses that operate on those lands, they run a private shuttle from the Kipling subway station to try and, because they have challenges getting employees to work in that area, given the lack of transit. So there's private, there's some private shuttles out there. Okay, but no, they're not really in that kind of, uh, at that level, yeah. where they're trying to encourage less cars at the airport. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, just a couple of questions for me. Uber, you are going through an experiment at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about that? At the beginning of June, we launched an 18-month pilot that uh, is allowing uh, 
transportation network companies to operate at the airport. Uh, we uh, are running it for 18 months. We're monitoring that. We've been working very closely with the taxi and limo industry at the airport to understand what the impacts of that will be. The reality for us is there's 200 airports in North America that allow these technical transportation network companies to operate. And every month we have 100,000 passengers that stand on the curb at the airport trying to get uh, an Uber or Lyft. And so we're responding to that passenger demand. We're running a pilot and we're monitoring it really closely to make sure that the impacts uh, are, are understood. So my next question, which is sort of following up on this in terms of customer service, because I asked about Uber because of the fact that I've heard a lot of people say, we had to wait so long, especially when a number of flights come in, trying to be able to leave the airport and accept, if you've got your prearranger, you're fine, but if you don't have that, and even with respect to the hotels and the shuttle service that they offer and so on, there's still some challenge. How um, is your feedback with respect to the customer service response from the customers who are frequenting and using the airport now? How is that satisfaction level? Mm -hmm. The um, response that we had almost immediately to the launching of the pilot was sort of, it's about time. It felt like Pearson was a little bit behind uh, other airports in North America in bringing in this service offering for its passengers. So, so far it's been a very positive response from passengers. Excellent. So you've come with lots of good news today, David yeah. and Laurie, yeah. and uh, we've, um, we're have we delighted with respect to the good news. But on the piece that's of really pressing important for the area and the airport, is it simply transit or is there some other issues that are of significant importance that you want us to be aware of? And if we're not aware of it already, are we working with you and are you satisfied with respect to the state of progress? No, I put, think you put your finger on it, Councillor. <clears throat> it's it's, it's uh, congestion in, on the ground around the airport and transit to and from the airport that we have shifted our focus on both as management and as, as a board. So that's very important focus and you're, you're well aware of that focus. Uh, the second uh, thing that the board talks about, of course, is, is investing in the airport itself to deal with the growth. There's just more people coming through. You need to, there's going to be construction underway as you operate a living airport to deal with the, the growth. We're in um, many, many meetings with Air Canada, working with them on how to accommodate the growth that they're bringing to the airport by expanding gates and so on. So hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent on the actual terminal plant to deal with the growth of passengers and a huge focus on ground transportation, getting people to and from the airport. Those are the two big ones. Excellent. Um, now, in, in my travels and uh, dealing with uh, other airport uh, companies and so on, who are looking to bring more passenger to Toronto uh, through the discussions that we have around investments coming into Toronto and tourism and so on, uh, we can continue to get, um, I guess, being raised with us, the need to have more landing opportunities at the airport. Um, that's not controlled by the GTA. That's controlled by NAV Canada. Is that the case? Right. Larry? No, the, uh, the, the slots to land are actually through the airport. Through you? Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, okay. NAV Canada is the flight paths and they control the actual landing of the okay. aircraft. But getting a slot to land, and we work with the airlines for that. Um, we continue to have slots available for landing. It may not be at the, the time that a carrier might want because we have peaks that are, that are filling so, up. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'll just be more specific. So I've had, um, uh, I believe, Emirates, and I've had some of the Chinese airlines who've said, we'd like to fly into Toronto more often. We're looking at bringing more investment. We can't get the landing ability there. So maybe you can speak to those. Sorry, I, you, I understand your question now. Um, you're talking about countries. There's bilateral agreement. agreements between yes. countries. Yes. And so between the UAE and Canada, there's an agreement that allows six flights a week. Right. Three go to Etihad and three goes to right. Emirates. Yeah. And so those agreements are country to country negotiations between the government of Canada and the other government, and they set out. The, the rights between uh, for So flight. it's beyond the GTA. It is beyond so. the GTA, yes. Okay. But you have the capacity. But we have the capacity, yes. Ah, yeah, okay. It's whether, you know, the market has to bear as well to see how many sure. flights you require. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're, not, we're not the sticking point. We have the capacity, but maybe not in the time slots that they would prefer, that they but want. we do have gate capacity. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, to speak, members? 
Okay, um, so I will just simply um, thank both of you for being here again to provide us with an update with respect to progress, um, excellent progress, quite frankly, at um, Pearson and the work that the GTAA is doing to bring more tourists to the area, um, the collaboration that you're working on with respect to the other airports across the region. I think that's exceptional work, quite frankly. You're creating more capacity and using your leverage and your leadership to exercise that, what I believe is strong business judgment. It's very prudent and it helps us all to benefit. Um, I note that the transit issue continues to be an issue across the board, and I note that our staff are looking at what can be done. We have moved further ahead than we were before. I'm delighted at that as well. Um, the airport, in, in my mind, has been very significant in our uh, progress and our economic prosperity here in the City of Toronto and the GTA, and I, I would say across the country, because a lot of people come here uh, more so now than before, this plan to make this a regional, a central place where people can come from all across the U.S. and land in Toronto and then go elsewhere. I see often, uh, I, I meet Americans and they're just very happy with respect to how they're received here in Canada, they're very warmly received, how they're treated and so on, and I think that should be conveyed back to your team and the crew about what uh, transpires uh, as, as part of uh, Pearson's um, plan for growth as well as customer satisfaction as well as the economic uh, benefits that's accruing to us and so on. So I want to congratulate uh, David, your leadership, Howard and, and Lori, um, and thank you so much because this uh, for us is a, a good thing. We realize that there are the issues around, you know, the work that was happening in the runway. When I tweeted it out, we had a number of response saying, when are they doing this? And they're concerned about timing and so on. And after we provided some information that we got from you, it was very helpful to the community at large. I know most of them were in Council Grimes area, but they nonetheless got the information and so on. Um, an issue around noise. I mean, there's a lot of work that's being done in this particular area. I, the, the, the question that was asked by Council Frakadakis, I think it's, it's a good one in terms of what they're doing in Boston, and I know that you're always looking to see globally what is happening in airports around the world and what could be emulated to provide an opportunity here in Toronto for us to provide better uh, service offering, better opportunities for people who come and land and are be able to get in the city or whatever, uh, wherever they're going, quite frankly. So that's really important. So I want to thank you both very much for being here. And I know that some of the most recent benefits that we receive, which is the collision conference, which starts next year in 2019. Uh, when I first met with them in Lisbon, one of the major things that they expressed to me was this notion around the airport and how they were really happy with respect to how your, our airport worked versus where they were in New Orleans and so on, and some of the challenges that they were having. They were very happy that people could actually fly directly into Toronto, and in some cases, other places, they would have to wait 12 hours to be able to make that, uh, you know, ability to get to that, make the connection to get to their destination. And so the efficiency of time, which is of great value to all of us because we don't have enough of it as it, as it is, and so by making time available to people, that is, a, in, in my view, a big bonus along with all the economic benefits and so on. And I know I speak as having been here for a while and uh, seeing where we have come to, from to where we are today in terms of not only our relationship, but the leadership and, and the structure and the strategic plan that has been actioned out and so on. Uh, I'm very happy with respect to what you presented us here today and I wish the GTA and the leadership team and so on at the GTA and the chairman certainly um, uh, good luck in, in moving forward and we're hoping that we could as a city respond to the needs to ensure that we can improve the transit and transportation system in and around the airport area. So thank you very much. All right, members, um, I'm, my, I'm going to move to receive the presentation. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. All right, moving right along, we'll just get the uh, setup for the next presentation, which is my presentation. Please let me know when you're ready. <clears throat> the 
Mr. General Manager, did you wish to uh, make a comment? Just to re uh, bring the members up to date on the point that uh, Councillor Kelly raised. Yes. Um, it is, our, our, our notes say that it was the City of Toronto, oh. but we need to correct the report to make sure that Sagamahara is connected to the City of Scarborough prior to amalgamation. That required me to sign a new version, which uh, Clerks is taking care of, so. Okay, fantastic. That would go forward to Council. So, Council Recordax, that really addresses the issue, and thank you for making the point. Thank you, Chair, for um, uh, facilitating uh, that information. Uh, I was wrong. I apologize. Sorry. My bad. No worries. That's very helpful. So then I can basically uh, wait. We'll wait until you have the final report, and then we'll move to deal with that. Staffs. Handed it in. Is it handed in? Okay. Okay. We can deal with that a little bit later on. It's just basically to receive it then. Um, are we ready? Thank you. So, uh, members, uh, we are now moving to um, item number uh, ED31.2, it's Economic Development Committee's chair remarks for the period of uh, 2011 and 2018. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, but I ask members just to bear with me. Uh, we have some slides plus my remarks. Um, economic development is an outlier in government. It is the only major activity with a mandate to create wealth and prosperity in the private sector. It fulfills this mandate by fostering collaboration, reducing barriers, providing success tools, and creating pathways to markets. Its success is measured by the health of the city's business enterprises, by investment attracted, jobs created, exports shipped, facilities expanded, and tax base expanded. It is, after all, about growth. Increasingly, pathways to growth cross borders and even oceans. Domestic growth alone cannot sustain our city. Nor in these times of belligerence and chaos across our southern borders. Can we continue to bet our prosperity mainly on our largest trading partner? While promoting global commerce is traditionally the domain of national governments, today's reality is different. International trade is increasingly conducted city to city, not nation to nation. Cities that ignores this trend and don't get into the game are losing out to approaches to approach overseas market with persistence and discipline. No city, no matter how attractive it is, can wait patiently for business to come its way. When cities snooze, they lose. This committee and this city must not let this happen to us. Over the past two terms of council, we have introduced sweeping changes to the city's approach to economic development. And to be clear, when I say economic development, I'm including culture. Cultural sector is a significant force and it plays a pivotal role in our overall prosperity. We brought business and cultural sector leaders together to help us plot a course for the future. We allocate new resources, develop new success tools, and improve existing programs and services. And by joining force with other municipalities and the province to market the region, the region globally, we've saved money, and applied it to other vital activities. We also became more aggressive in developing international relationships that brings investment to Toronto and open new market for export for our businesses. Our mission to China, for example, where we met the Greenland Corporation, one of the largest real estate development companies. We sold them on Toronto, and they have committed to an initial investment here of $1.2 billion, with the potential of millions more to follow. These projects that they have invested in have created about 3,000 jobs in Toronto. Our 2015 mission to India, we had meetings with the folks at Tech Mahindra, and they have committed to investing $100 million in artificial intelligence and blockchain. They are developing a center of excellence in Toronto that will in fact create hundreds of high paying tech jobs. After the mayor and I met with Uniqlo's president and chairman in Japan, 
The company announced that it was opening two stores in Toronto and hiring 300 people. Business trips to Lisbon and New Orleans to meet with organizers of the Collision Technology Conference enable us to bring this massive conference to Toronto for three years beginning 2019. The organizers have estimated that this will attract 30,000 attendees and inject $150 million per year in our economy. Benefits from relation built, relationship buildings go far beyond the linear. Often, someone met on a mission recommends to us to another person who contacts us about an investment or trade opportunity they're considering. International business is conducted people to people, not company to company or government to government. Relationship building reinforces our brands in foreign markets and draws business to our city. Traditionally, Toronto's international economic development efforts focus mainly on attracting foreign direct investment. Over the past term of Council, we have taken decisive steps to promote uh, export trade. The Mayor and I are committed to establishing partnerships in priority global markets with governments, channel partners and trade organizations. On our watch, Toronto has increased its formal international relationships from nine three years ago to 28 as of today. These agreements and our other overseas activities are laying the foundation for Toronto's companies to enter and succeed in foreign markets. The success of these companies abroad leads to business growth and new jobs in our city. Along with our aggressive approach to developing international markets, we have in fact expanded our effort to help potential local exporters leverage our portfolio of international relationships. While major corporations can generally handle these on their own, small and medium-sized companies need help to enter export markets. Consequently, we have partnered with the World Trade Center Toronto to provide training, guidance and support. Over 1,500 companies or individuals have signed up for training so far and more than 400 foreign companies are engaged. In total, small and medium-sized companies in the GTA have increased their annual export sales by $138 million and created over 1,000 new jobs. Viral technology have participated in the TAP program. This has resulted in expanded sales of 325% a 30% increase in staff, and they have, in fact, expanded into new markets in Europe, Australia, and Taiwan. Our program of support for business are strong and getting stronger. We have lowered small business to residential property tax ratio from 2.93% in 2011 to 2.44% in 2018. We have established an excellent startup infrastructure including business incubators in a number of sectors. And our BIA programs have grown over 15% since 2011. BIA member business now employ over 540,000 people. The Digital Main Street Initiative is helping small businesses grow by harnessing the full power of information technology. The program has assisted more than 5,000 Main Street businesses employ digital platform over the last two years. Our Gold Star program and other support for larger companies are helping to secure business expansion investment for Toronto. For example, staff work with Sanofi Pasteur, Canadian division, to secure $500 million and 170,000 square feet uh, expansion in their state-of-the-art vaccine production facility. The facility retains 1,500 jobs and added another, another 50, and in fact created another 1,500 construction jobs. The company's Cannot Campus is the, the North American Center for Excellence in Analytical and Bioprocessing, R&D for Snow Fee Pasture globally. 
It solidifies that the Toronto site as a national strategic asset for research and development and manufacturing of vaccines that protects public health in Canada and around the world. The Toronto International brand, ladies and gentlemen, is strong and growing. And our overseas missions are spreading our message directly to decision makers and business leaders in key uh, markets around the world. Events like the 2015 Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games in 2015, and last year's North American Indigenous Games, and of course the Invictus Games, got broad favorable worldwide coverage for the city. Billions of marketing impressions were generating, generated by these events. The attendees at major international conference held here, like the 10,000 engineers from the US and abroad that attended the National Society of Black Engineer Conference in Toronto, and the 15,000 IT leaders at the Microsoft World Partnership Convention in both 2012 and 2016. In each of the next three years, the Collision Conference will also unleash another 30,000 high-tech word spreaders that will be of benefits to our city. Arts and culture, our most cherished economic sectors, also play a significant role in revealing Toronto to the world. The city's Creative Capital Gains Arts and Cultural Plan, which we introduced in 2011, injected new energy into the sector by providing or building a new uh, level of collaboration uh, framework that has helped us. And in fact, the City of Toronto has increased its annual expenditure in arts from $18 per capita to 25. On average, each dollar invested by the city through Toronto Arts Council attract another $16 from other levels of government and also the private sector and ticket sales. In the film and television, the city has paved the way for private sector investment by making space available in the Portlands for new studios and supporting the reopening of the former Showline Studios, which we acquired. We have promoted the expansion of our screen industry infrastructure by joining missions to Los Angeles to remind Hollywood that Toronto is a prime production location. The city's focus on the screen industry is in fact paying off. In 2011, 2011 expenditure in film and television production in Toronto rose from $1.1 billion to over $2 billion in 2016. It dropped a little to $1.8 billion in 2017. And this was in fact due to our limited uh, limits on production capacity. If we had the space, that number of $2.2 billion would have exceeded. We are working diligently with the private sectors to build more capacity. Last year, Toronto produced the Shape of Water here. The Shape of Water re received 13 Academy Award nominations and four Oscars. 2016 Sewer Side Squad grossed over $750 million. The Handmaiden's Tale TV series won eight Emmys and the long-running Suits TV series led to a royal wedding. Let's take a look at some of these key measures of performance and to see how Toronto is doing. Well, the Toronto regional economy is growing faster than Canada as a whole and in fact, faster than the combined G7. In office and industrial construction, the city has added 8.4 million square feet of new office development since 2011, including nine facilities over 500 square feet. Another 7 million square feet are under construction, including 2.7 million at CIBC Square and the 1.7 million at Young Street. 15 million more are in pre-construction phase. Equally encouraging, office and industrial vacancy rates are at an all-time low, and the value of non-residential building permits is the highest it's ever been over the last, it's the highest it's been over the last seven years through the period of 2017. 
Most of Toronto's key business sectors are strong and growing, with design and financial services performing exceptionally well. Ex excess, especially encouraging are our employment numbers. At the beginning of this term, members, we committed to generating 20,000 new, net new jobs per year for Torontonians. I'm proud to say we have, in fact, exceeded that number. We've netted 220,000 new jobs since the benchmark 2011 year, or about 31,000 new jobs on average. The rate of growth in Toronto is much faster than the rest of Canada. Unemployment in the city has dropped from 9.2% in 2011 to 7.2% in 2017. It currently stands at 6.8%. Although the Toronto's population has grown by 282,500 people, 36,000 fewer residents are unemployed, and we're very proud of this fact. Unfortunately, there is still high unemployment in certain areas of Toronto and in equity-seeking groups. Going forward, TESS will focus on promoting inclusive economic prosperity, which means ensuring that programs and services reach all Torontonians across the city so that no one is left behind. All of our hard work has helped Toronto move up the ranks as a major global commercial centre. Last year, FDI magazine ranked Toronto fourth amongst North American cities of the future. We moved up three spots from 2011. Accordingly, Zen Y Group, uh, we are now, according to the Zen Y Group, we are now number seventh amongst global financial centres, moving up three spots from 2011. And finally, moving forward in the spirit of continuous improvement, I believe that we should once again take a hard look at our activities and determine where we should focus our efforts in the years ahead. It is in fact essential that we understand which initiatives work, which are underperforming, and which should be re-engineered, and in fact, which should be scrapped. It is my view that given the finite resources available for economic development, the most effective or promising activities should be prioritized. We have made encouraging progress over the past term. We must determine the best way to keep the ball rolling in the terms ahead. Members, that's my report to you for the period of 2011 to 2018. I'm available for questions if any member has questions. Okay, seeing none, I want to just thank members for making this possible and thank the team uh, led by Mr. Williams um, uh, and Patricia Walcott from TESS and uh, Madam DCM, Acting DCM. I want to thank the team of Economic Development for making this uh, report uh, that I just delivered here today not only possible, but working together in terms of all of our efforts. There are so many staff members that I would like to thank, but to thank one or two beyond the uh, leaders and so on, I'm going to forget some names, but all I can say is that we have done amazingly great work um, uh, that we have seen here today. I note in the, um, in the slide, and I think maybe it's the second last slide in terms of this, this is an important slide that I think we need to take a look at. It looks at um, the amount that economic development has paid for international missions and so on, and we've spent about $1.27 million uh, for total mission. Expense paid on international mission for the, ch of the chair, EDC, $120,000. The number that I really think that we have to look at here, which I believe is extremely important, it's the return on investment from international missions, and that's $1.4 billion. And we still have a number of, um, uh, of applications that are coming forward as a result of our efforts. So I can say job well done by all of us and all the activities, and I want to just give special mention to the mayor and his leadership. The mayor has been steadfast that my responsibility, my role was to sell, sell, sell. Those are the three commands that I received from the mayor, to sell, sell, sell. 
I believe that we will continue to do this based on the infrastructure and the foundation that we have established for this committee. This again, I remind you all, this is the only committee that is focusing on wealth, wealth creation. Every other committee in the city of Toronto focuses on wealth distribution. And I think that we have a strong role to play. We have played a strong role, and I look forward to us playing a strong role going forward. So members, though, that is my report to you today. All right, so uh, I'm going to move receipt of my report. <laughs> oh, Councillor Kelly to speak. I'm sorry, anyone to speak, I'm, I apologize. Councillor Kelly to speak. Well, thank you, Chair, uh, for the report. Um, the, uh, I'm one of the few people of my age that was born and raised in Toronto, uh, and I've seen the remarkable transformation uh, from a, a provincial town to an international uh, metropolis. Um, two decades ago, uh, when I uh, went abroad on behalf of the city of Toronto, the response that I got from the cities uh, that I was visiting was, where have you been? Um, you know, these are the cities that have uh, preceded you, uh, and we were wondering why Toronto was so silent. And I think what's happened, uh, Chair, under your leadership, uh, and with the enthusiastic uh, support of uh, staff, uh, is that we've gone out there and beat the bushes uh, so that Toronto uh, is now a familiar name and the opportunities that we present uh, to others uh, around the world with respect to investments here and uh, opportunities for receipt of our goods and services there uh, is remarkable. Um, the return on investments that you have on page 23, uh, I think, as you mentioned, is critically important. Uh, I read a book by uh, the guy who uh, is the president of Gallup, and uh, he said that no matter where they ask the question uh, around the world about the most important things to people there, um, the answer was almost the, always the same, jobs. People are looking for jobs. And we all know the importance of jobs. Helps to keep the family together, uh, promotes social stability, um, carries within it the, uh, the ability to, to grow uh, the economy. And secondly, as you mentioned, uh, the Chair, uh, politics is, uh, uh, in many ways is the tension between two aspects of, of uh, political life. Uh, economic growth on the one hand and social investments on the other. And if you don't have economic growth, you don't have the ability to tax and pivot the money into the social investments that we all know are important. Um, Economic growth identifies opportunities. The social investment side of uh, political life identifies uh, challenges. Uh, and while there is tension between those two aspects, uh, it's critical to realize the relationship between them. So, uh, Chair, kudos to you, uh, this committee uh, and the uh, staff and all the very best uh, going forward. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kelly. Anyone else to speak? Okay, seeing none. Okay, so I'm going to move receipt of the presentation. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Reckon. Before we start on the next item, I have to use the ladies' room. Um, yes. If you could just take a break and bless, and Councillor Grimes wants to return. Right, okay, so we don't have quorum, so we'll just sell. Sorry. Just motion to recess for um, five minutes. Okay, those in favor? Thank you. All right.
Okay, members, we are ready to convene. Committee is now resumed. Uh, members, before we go to um, ED 31.3, the uh, general manager has revised um, page 3 off 11 um, of ED uh, 31.4, uh, and so, which is the Asia mission. So with your indulgence, if you've had a chance to take a look at that, I'd simply like to uh, move adoption of the item. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you. So we've dispensed with uh, 31.4 and we've adopted. Okay. We're now moving to ED 31.3, deascensing uh, and transfer of the City of Toronto's uh, Lancaster bomber. We have a number of speakers, and the first speaker that I have is Brian Monroe. Mr. Monroe, are you here? Please come forward, sir. You can sit at the uh, table there, and you'll have five minutes to speak, sir. And to all members, you'll have five minutes to speak. Members of the committee may ask you questions or may not. Okay? Please, sir, I'll start your time when you're all ready to go. Let me know when you're ready, please. But it's a major change since April the 13th. Since April the 13th, Bombardier has announced they're moving out of Downsview. What a phenomenal opportunity for Toronto to build an air, land, and sea museum at the Downsview Airport. Those hangars are all going to become empty. That, and I'll say also, since April the 13th, the only flying Lancaster in the world of the two, Lanc of the two that are flying, it went down to Washington, D.C. 17,000 people lined up to see that aircraft and just to touch and see it. And I can see why we're giving away an economic uh, phenomenal gold mine for Toronto on the market to a, a corporation out west and in Victoria, B.C. That uh, with the Avro Arrow, which is sitting out at Pearson right now, rotting away, uh, that aircraft and the Lancaster be, be key aircraft, keystones for a museum at Downsview. It's just vision and, and foresight and entrepreneurship to make this happen in Toronto. That uh, the muse I'll say the Smithsonian expected two million people in the first year. They got them the first three months. The Smithsonian Museum took as up to this point 555 million people as visited the Smithsonian Museum. And we've got so much in Canada to be proud of. Modesty is one thing, but the, what's come out of Downsview and what we have stored in Toronto, the GTC vehicles are in storage, the, the fire trucks are in storage, the Marine Museum is in storage. We have so much put away in Toronto that could come out and be showcased at Downsview. That the infrastructure is all there now at Downsview. The, the, the subways, the highways, 555 acres are up there. It's, it's a phenomenal economic return that Toronto could earn. And to give away this Lancaster to a, a corporation out west, that Lancaster returned to Toronto in 1964, returned home to Toronto in 1964, because it's one of 447 Lancasters were built in Toronto. There's nothing left of, of, the, of the airport, of the Victory Aircraft Plant that produced the Avro Arrow. We, we, we destroyed that. Now, to this aircraft could, oh, there's a concern for $25,000 for storage fees for the aircraft. The, all the aircraft and artifacts came out of Downs here at the Toronto Aerospace Museum and the 45 tractor trailers. Why couldn't this Lancaster go in to maybe four or five tractor trailers that could be donated? And I spoke to a corporation. They would probably donate the trailers to store the aircraft and eliminate the $25,000 fee that the city is paying. That's only coffee money in, in the city's billion-dollar dollar budget. That, uh, that's just some of the, the items I'd like to bring forward. And the fact that it, that, uh, it could be a phenomenal a dollar-making uh, proposition for Toronto. And you said for um, the, the, uh, the mayor, uh, John Tory, to sell, sell, sell. Um, so much came out of Downsview, all the aircraft that they're flying in the United Nations colors. The jetliner that came out of Toronto, only two were, two were built, came out of Toronto. Howard Hughes wanted to buy that aircraft. All these stories, Amelia Earhart, uh, started flying in Toronto at Armour Heights Height Airport, up the corner of uh, Armour Heights was up at Avenue Road in 401. People don't know that. Uh, insulin developed in Toronto. All these stories could be shown at this museum, and I say Air, Land and Sea Museum, that uh, 
that, that just a, uh, I'm just going to plant the seed and to save this aircraft from leaving Toronto to go to a, a corporation, to a museum uh, in Victoria. Museums don't have money. I believe there's a private corporation going to come behind that aircraft and restore it to their benefit. And how many people in Toronto joined the RCF versus those who joined the RCF in, in Victoria, BC? And the fellows who joined the RCF underage and gave their lives, we're stomping on the RCF flag now, what we're doing by just uh, disbanding this uh, massive, uh, uh, maybe I may call it a tombstone, in their honour, and uh, sending it down the road. And, and I speak to people on the subway, and, uh, and they say, that's a disgrace, and people that I, I just, you know, off the cuff, and they say, what's going on? What is the city doing? That they realize what they've got, this, this, um, this potential um, gold mine to bring money into Toronto. But uh, that's uh, on that. And, uh, and here's another option, virtual reality museum. Uh, there's a gentleman here, I don't know him personally, Randy Lennox of Pinewood Studios. Uh, they could use this aircraft, uh, the gentleman up in the cockpit of the, say, the Avro Arrow, and uh, like um, Jan Zierakowski, and, to, uh, and also the, the, the Lancaster. They use these aircraft as props, like it's done in California now. Some of the uh, places down there are using these aircraft. Uh, they have a, a virtual tour to, to Mars. We could do the same thing in Toronto at the Pinewood Studio. This is just my own idea. Mr. Okay. Penix doesn't even know where I, where thank I come you. from. Thank you very much, sir. You're at five thank minutes. Thank, thank you. For I'll see if there's any questions for you. Are there any questions for Mr. Monroe? Yeah, there are no questions for you, sir. Thank, thank thanks you for much. even investing with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next uh, speaker is Jane Mitchell, Save Lancaster uh, FM 104. Ms. Mitchell, could you please come forward? Please let me know when you're ready, ma'am. I will start your time. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jane Mitchell, and uh, thank you for city councillors and staff visitors for coming today. I certainly commend the city for um, their April deferral and uh, second review of our proposal. I am only one of the legacies of survivors of Bomber Command. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if my father had not survived, and I stand in my father's place today. Um, besides the actual war effort in theatre, the war effort included those who gave up years of their youth, their retirement, they sent their children to be looked after by their grandparents in order that they work in factories for the war effort, including the Avro factory at uh, Moulton by Pearson Airport as we know it today. We had a very impressive um, presentation today of Pearson. Um, Lancaster, Save Lancaster 104, the Toronto Lancaster Group is deeply disappointed by the recommendation. Um, however, again, we do thank the city for their undertaking and for that supplementary review, and I'm honoured to be here today representing that group, along with Lynn Berry. Lancaster FM 104 symbolises families who lost loved ones, certainly and those are from all over the world. There are families who've had to carry on like my own normally after the war, raising their children, driving them to school. There are the victory families I've already mentioned. There are families in Europe who heard, first of all, then saw the Lancaster and other bombers flying overhead. There are those who flew and worked for search and rescue after the war until 1964. There are also those who worked as hard as they could to try and restore FM 104 here in the city after uh, 1999, but they couldn't finish their job for various reasons. Thank you for this time, and I think that this Lancaster FM 104 is a very gracious old lady. It deserves great care and great um, deep work with its rehabilitation and restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Mitchell. Um, the next speaker is Murray Connolly, uh, who is with uh, Edenvale Aviation Heritage Foundation. Mr. Connolly? Oh, you're here. Mr. Conley, please let me know when you're ready, sir, and I'll start you. Uh, yes, I will. 
We had three uh, speakers, but uh, we had them in the other orders, but that's okay. That's, uh, we can manage this. I was doing a sum up, so we'll get that in. in uh... I just call it as I see them, sir. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Your name was first. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, councillors, and city staff. You have just heard from two of our professional management team. These are the core and the heart of the restoration and ongoing maintenance of the airplane <clears throat> and have a world of experience. Mr. David Snedden is an aircraft maintenance engineer, a transport minister designated representative, and a member of the AME Hall of Fame. He's the chairman of the board of directors of the Simcoe County Museum and sits on the county council. The next speaker would be a retired Major Les Ball. He's an aerospace engineer with an outstanding career as an RCAF aircraft maintenance and repair officer, commander of a maintenance squadron, and held a leadership role in technical training management. This tech accession process has been ongoing now for the better part of a year. During the summer of 2017, the city sent notice by, uh, of the deck accession to the interested parties, followed by questionnaires requesting, sorry, requesting uh, specific information. We responded to the request with the information available to us at the time and subsequently with more specific information. This information formed the majority of the staff assessment of EHF, EAHF to the April committee meeting. A lot of the enhanced planning and preparation that took place over the seven month interval between the initial uh, proposal and the April meeting uh, subsequent to the April meeting, we felt that we should prepare and submit a staff to the staff and the committee an update uh, situation report on our foundation. Some of the highlights of the up update are uh, a new terminal building, an aircraft display building uh, under construction at Edenvale as we speak, is an integral part of our financial plan. The building has a business uh, center on the second floor the revenue from which will operate the building and also provide for the post-restoration and ongoing maintenance of the Lancaster. We believe that if you do not have a strong financial plan and exercise total control of your expenses, you are not going to succeed in this business. There are several examples of aircraft restorations that have fallen by the wayside because they concentrated on the bright, shiny object and not their financial plans. By structuring our business plan in such a manner that our O&M budget is operated to a similar model as I've just described uh, for the business center. The restoration portion of the budget comes entirely from private sources. We do not expect to receive nor will we accept funding from the public purse. We strongly believe the aircraft restoration due to the risks involved is an expense that the taxpayer should not be expected to shoulder. Our marketing research tells us that we are at the are located at the gateway of Ontario's year-round recreation and tourist area. We can expect to see, on average, 10,000 vehicles per day pass by our front door. The potential for this exposure is enticing. As you are a committee involved in the economic development sphere, I don't have to point out the enormous possibilities available to the nearby communities and businesses created by the presence of this aircraft. The cooperative venture that you'll hear about that we are in the process of <clears throat> Developing with the Air Force has a side effect of reducing our restoration costs and at the same time comes at no expense to the military. A win-win situation that benefits both parties. I hope that I have been able to convey this to this committee that we are a competent and serious organization that is more than capable to, to take on this task. We have demonstrated that we are financially and technically sound and have at our disposal the very best people and facilities available. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Conley? Okay. Councillor Kelly, questions? Questions of you for Councillor Kelly to your right here, sir. Okay. In the uh, report that uh, has been submitted by uh, staff, uh, they indicate that um, the group um, doesn't have the experience, the background, uh, to establish and operate a major tourism attraction facility. How would you respond to that? Uh, I uh, updated that uh, piece of information in the uh, proposal, updated proposal I submitted last week for review. All of us that are members of the Edendale Aviation Heritage Foundation also belong to 
the uh, Edendale Classic Aircraft Foundation. And they're a um, museum that operates uh, uh, heritage aircraft, two of which are uh, former RCF airplanes of the very type that pilots learning their trade would have flown that went on from there to the Lancaster. This is a museum that's been in existence for 30 years, still operating very successfully, and uh, an organization that we've been very proud to be a member of. We are now not an extension of, e of the uh, Classic Aircraft Foundation, but a new organization, but we carry the values of that organization with us. The, on page three of the re staff report, it indicates that the costs of restoration and uh, the creation of a permanent museum in which to put the aircraft um, could be as high uh, as $13 million. Would you agree with that? No, sir. Not the model that we have put together. With the support of the Edenville uh, uh, Aerodrome Limited Company, uh, they are providing us with the facilities that we need. First of all, if, uh, uh, to start the restoration program, there's a hangar with 8,000 square feet, new hangar, uh, suitably insulated so that you can work in it in the wintertime, which is not something that most restoration groups get to do. And uh, starting, or has started a month ago and is in the process of being constructed now, is this new terminal building that is a two-story, 150 by 150 square foot building. Uh, on the second story is a business center. The ground floor will contain airport operations, flight planning, et cetera, but the major portion of that uh, bottom floor will be an aircraft display area, large enough and suitable for the Lancaster. That building is situated very close to Highway 26, provincial highway that I talked about is the possibility that all the cars that would pass by there at, uh, uh, and be able to see this airplane. The possibilities for development in that sphere are enormous. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Uh, anyone else? Seeing none. Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The uh, next uh, speaker is Ronald Ball, who is um, with the Edenville Aviation Heritage Foundation. Mr. Ball? Please let me know when you're ready, sir. I can start your time. You have five minutes to speak, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, councillors, and city staff. As stated, I'm Ronald Ball, a retired RCF Aerospace Engineering Maintenance Officer. I'd like to speak to you today as a supporter of the Edenville Aviation Heritage Foundation and as an Air Force veteran. Now we're looking at the Lancaster since 1964, sitting in a state of storage at Edenville, waiting for something to happen to it. Part of the tasks that we looked at, and I think Mr. Kelly talked about uh, where are we going to get qualified people to work on this. Part of the stuff that has been happening in the last year was have being a maintenance engineer and at CFB Borden 16 wing RCAF, and the CIFSAIC, which is the Canadian Forces School of Aerospace Technology and Engineering. And for all the city staff that were here, you will remember in September when there was four squadrons of them in the square down here receiving the new colors. Them all come, they're all technicians that come from CFB Borden at that time. The part where we come up with is, Murray mentioned no cost to the Crown, but there's another item that fits in this is that the recruiting process in the Canadian Forces and the actual training of the students, there is a case where the recruiting is continuous all the time and we end up with more recruits than we're capable of putting in the class at the same time. And from going through the system, I joined as a non-commissioned member back in 63 and I went through the process that I'm going to tell you about, is that you end up with technicians that are went through their basic training, then they come to CIFSAIC, and because the classes are for them to take, they could get there at the very beginning and miss out on the start of the class, so they're gonna sit there for weeks and weeks waiting for another class to start for them. And the worst part of it is the school is basically set up to teach technicians. It isn't set up to provide 
in all honesty, babysitting service or some sort of employment. So what we did is we went to 16 Wing and the Commandant of SIFSAT and talked to them and made a proposal to them that the students that are awaiting training, which is only a short distance away from where we are in Edenville, Linton Borden, is that them st students awaiting training could be part of the m manpower system at Edenville to help the restoration program go forward. In the process, it also come out that we found that there's several of the instructors would be very willing to lead their expertise that they already have in this to come up and assist us as well. So the other caveat that I like to bring up in this is that when the students finally go through their training, they will have some basic concept of tool control and uh, maintenance environment already instilled in them before they start their course. And one of the most interesting aspects of this in the sense that we're talking about the Lancaster is that years down the road when we're looking about our heritage, these students will be able to spout off to anybody else that wants to listen. I worked on the Lancaster bomber. That come out and as I was researching a little bit of helping Murray and uh, Dave figure out what to talk about today, I'd like to reiterate, I was the officer in charge in 96 of all the technical ta trades training in the school. And that's what the school is really called, the technical trade training school. Since I've left, there's been a great push to bring heritage back into our RCAF. And lo and behold, the school is now called the Lancaster Squadron. So what great thing we would have is that uh, Lancaster that's sitting here now moved to Edenville. When it's all put back together, we could say that it was originally helped put back together by members of the Lancaster Squadron from the school at Sifsi. In putting this together, I'd like to bring out the fact that as a member of the RCF Association, in recognition of putting this project together, the National Executive Council of the RCF has passed a resolution of support for the Edenville Aviation Heritage Foundation for the initiative shown in develop developing this unique venture. So, Mr. Chair and Councillors, that is all I have to say and hopefully it will provide some insight as to where we're going to get the manpower to help put the aircraft back together again. Is, is there oh, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions for um, Mr. Ball? I just have a couple for you, sir. Okay. So um, I think your last mention about uh, the RCF, the, there was a motion that was moved to support? From our national executive. From your national be, executive. It will be brought up at our convention in October out in Calgary. That This is something that the executive has done to show their support for our organization at Edenville. So, um, I mean, obviously the elephant in the room is the dollars, the ability to do the restoration and resources to be able to do that. Uh, can you help me to understand a little bit better, perhaps your organization's ability to raise the necessary funding? That part right now is that the people that are here today, we, we work every week, every Thursday out there free working on uh, maintaining the aircraft that are flying. We've got a Tiger Moth and a Cornell that fly, uh, plus two other aircraft. And I've been involved with uh, some of the other people of just working on restoration of old aircraft engines. All of that is just coming out of our pockets, basically. There isn't, to, so when it comes to the cost of doing this, that's still in, in Murray's pocketbook as to how he's working with the Heritage Fund, the Edenville Heritage Fund, is how we're going to process that. Right. How many how many planes do you now have in Edenville? Four. Four. Yeah. And what are those planes? Uh, there's a Tiger Moth and a Cornell. And I'm going to have to ask Murray for the other. Uh, plane, uh, they have to tell the Okay, that's great, sir. That's a little unusual. We normally ask the speaker to speak. Well, I, thank you. Appreciate I wanted it. to make sure you got the right answer. No, no, no. And I appreciate that, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so, 
you have some challenge now with respect to resources. You indicated that it's coming out of members' pockets now to do some of the restoration, do some of the repairs on the planes you have now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And um, the conversation around um, how much the restoration cost would be for the um, uh, Lancaster, um, you've been having those discussions in terms of the ability of your group to be able to provide the funding? Murray's working on that. He's, Murray's, he's working on that? Yeah. And what's the timeline for the working on to be completed? To be honest, we'd like to go along with the other Lancaster that's being put back together in Trenton, which is highlighted to be put back together by 2024, so it would be available for show on the outside part of it for sure for the 100th anniversary of the RCAF. So you are doing the other Lancaster? No, no. No, I'm just talking about there is another Lancaster. Yes, I'm aware of that. I just wanted to make sure I understand your involvement with that. No. Your involvement in that is nothing? No, not involved with that, just other than being a, seeing it, but knowing that that's, that is the objective of that program in Trenton was right. done. And I would like to see ours go down the road the same way so that we would have two Lancasters uh, with visible outside completion by 2024. Okay, okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Our next um, speaker is uh, David Sneddon. Seddon, Edenville Aviation Heritage Foundation. Mr. Seddon, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Please let me know when you're ready, sir. I'll start your time. You'll have five minutes to speak, and also members will have an opportunity to question you if there's any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Dave Sneddon. I'm a member of the Edenville Foundation Group. I'm also the chair of the Simple County Museum Board and also responsible for libraries and archives as their chair. I'm also a Transport Canada Minister's Delegate for maintenance issues, airworthiness. We have a program put in place which covers the next number of years of restoring this aircraft. It takes us over about a 10-year period. And we look at putting approximately 2,000 to 3,000 hours per year restoring it. The cost of this is going to be borne by a great donation we happen to have, a private commitment of almost a half a million dollars. And that is broken up over a five year period. Many organizations can't say that. We do have the money. We do have the expertise. I am also the chief engineer of the only flying Lancaster in Canada when it made its maiden flight. Sorry to say, that's the year I had a second heart attack. So my involvement had to cease shortly after that. This work can all be done with the local people, as been said, about the Air Force helping us. We have, I have excellent people with me to do this. The other thing we're going to do in the rebuilding of this aircraft is offer classroom training to civilians who want to learn something about aircraft maintenance, how to do things, how to proper torques, how to use river guns, etc. And there's a lot to that. We do have a large number, and I mean a very large number of retired military people living in Simcoe County, somewhere in excess of 30,000 people with various degrees of skills. It is our hope and our intent, has been said here, that we have this aircraft ready to roll out the door for 2024, that it can be shown with Camp Borden. Because Camp Borden and Edenville were same bases during the war. You have to think about that. We have this firm commitment of money, facility, and equipment. And there is no questions that is guaranteed. As was said to you, the initial uh, restoration will start in an 8,000 square foot hangar and will expand in about two years into the 22,000 square foot hangar. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm going to leave it at that, knowing what I know, and I wish you the very best. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, sir. All right, any questions? Okay, seeing none. Okay, thank you. Um, our next um, a speaker is Lynn Berry, Save Lancaster Group. Ms. Berry? Again, Ms. Berry, you'll have five minutes, and just please let me know when you're ready. I'll start your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am with the Save Lancaster FM 104 group, and I would like to start by thanking you for giving us the opportunity to work with your staff to find a way to keep this Lancaster in Toronto. I would like to specifically thank Mike Williams and Wayne Reeves for their generous time at our meeting in June. They have studied our proposal, and we have listened to their concerns. I believe we have gained respect for our efforts and hard work to find a property and to try and secure funding from government sources and private corporations. We were eligible for a total of 73% funding of the cost of the building, 40% from the federal government and 33% from the province through a joint venture between the federal and provincial infrastructure programs. Unfortunately, the application process for that funding will not be available until the end of this year. And upon further research, these infrastructure funds were dependent on the City of Toronto and or private donors contributing the other 27%. The City was unable to find these funds. We also looked into the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund and many other agencies for funding. We were in contact with Melanie Jolie, who is the Heritage Minister of Canada, and she gave us a great deal of information as to who we could contact next. From day one, we started contacting large corporations and foundations for, the for donations for the restoration of the aircraft and a new building to house it in. Many of these corporations showed a genuine interest in becoming involved. However, because we did not have ownership of the aircraft, they hesitated to come forward. One corporation was interested in the possibility of putting their name on the building we were proposing and we ran into problems with that for the exact same reason. I personally approached well over 50 corporations in person when I dropped off letters of introduction. For many of them, their community involvement had a particular scope which did not align with an historic aircraft. I made many calls, sent many, many emails, spoke to banks, communications companies, the auto sector, transportation, the airlines, and the aerospace companies, who were all very interested in the story and were very impressed with our passion and determination. I did receive one letter of intent, but it fell short of the amount of money we needed in the immediate future. We had the support of many prominent people, Senator Ann Cools in Ottawa, Carl Kasgard, the director of the Bomber Command Museum of Canada in Nanton, the Royal Canadian Air Force Association, <coughs> Councillor Campbell of the City of Toronto. We also had one of the most experienced Lancaster restoration engineers on our team, Tim Moles, who restored the Andrew Minarski Memorial Lancaster, which now flies in Toronto, sorry, in Hamilton. My motivation for this campaign to save FM 104 and keep her in Toronto is my personal connection to the Lancaster. My uncle, Robert John Westgate, was killed in a Lancaster in Bomber Command. Many people in our group had the same connection as me and have lost a relative. Others had relatives who flew in a Lancaster but survived the war. These were young men, some as young as 18. They gave up jobs, left their families, and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force because they believed in the cause. The total number of Canadians lost in Bomber Command was 10,673. The lifespan of a bomber crew was only two weeks. My other reason for trying to keep this Lancaster here is to preserve its history with the city. It was built in Malton and given to the city by the RCAF after the war. Thousands of young men and women worked at to build 430 of these bombers at Avro. I had a conversation with a lady not too long ago who is now 95 and she still lives in Malton. She was a riveter and she is in that iconic picture of the first Lancaster leaving the hangar and she's standing on the wing. She is devastated that this might leave the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto must give recognition to the service of the Lancaster. A beautiful plaque and memorial must be put in Coronation Park where this Lancaster was once displayed in remembrance of our Bomber Command veterans and the Avro workers. It is the least the city can do if this aircraft does not remain here. It needs to have some markings painted on it so that its connection with Toronto's history is never forgotten. 
In closing, I want you to know that we put our heart and soul into trying to save this Lancaster. I want to thank my team for their dedication, their hard work, and most of all, their passion. Our group now numbers 1,340 members worldwide. I have devoted the past nine months to this campaign, and I will be truly devastated and heartbroken if it moves to BC, because I feel the city has not recognized its significance to our history. My uncle's 97 Squadron motto was achieve your aim. I believe that we have done just that. One day when the history of the 20th century is finally written, it will be recorded that when human society stood at the crossroads and civilization itself was under siege, the Royal Canadian Air Force was there to fill the breach and help give humanity the victory. And You're all those who have part ma'am. in it... You have much have to go, more to go? One more sentence. Please, okay. We'll yeah. have left to posterity a legacy of honour, courage and valour that time can never despoil. Okay, thank you thank very you much, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, there are no questions of you, ma'am. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, the um, final speaker I have on my list is a Mr. John Lewis. Mr. Lewis, you're here, sir? Okay, please come forward, sir. And again, sir, you have five minutes, and uh, members may choose to ask you questions if they so wishes. Please let me know when you're ready, sir. Yeah, I'm ready. Fantastic. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. My name is John Lewis. I'm the president of the British Columbia Aviation Museum, which is located on the grounds of Victoria International Airport. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak again in support of our proposal. I'd like to briefly recap five reasons why we believe our proposal has unique merit. First of all, we have a long track record of steady growth. The museum was founded 30 years ago. During that time, we have steadily upgraded our collection, which now consists of more than 25 aircraft displayed in three hangars with a total floor space of more than 25,000 square feet. We're open 363 days a year. Many of our aircraft were restored by our volunteers from an extremely poor condition. These include a Bolingbrook and an Anson, which date from the same era as the Lancaster. Secondly, we're in a solid financial position our current cash reserves are more than $200,000. We are a registered charity. We own our hangars. We have a reasonable, sorry, a renewable, very reasonable, renewable long-term lease for our land from the Victoria Airport Authority. The current lease has 10 years left to run. Restoring the Lancaster represents a significant challenge, one greater than any we have found before. Uh, for this reason, and this is our third um, reason, we are partnering with our neighbor, Victoria Air Maintenance, an internationally recognized professional aircraft restoration organization. Their involvement in supervision of the project will ensure the integrity of the restoration work and its proper recording and certification in accordance with Transport Canada standards. They have inspected the Lancaster at Stainer and are confident that it can be completely restored. I should also mention that we've had a remarkable surge of enthusiasm from skilled workers at other aviation organizations at the Victoria Airport who are very keen to participate. Uh, our fourth reason is that our proposal has no financial risks for the city. Once you give us the uh, plane, you're out of it. But the most important and the last reason for favoring our proposal is that it would allow the Lancaster to be displayed to the public, at least in part, immediately. This Lancaster has been hidden from public view for the last seven years. It should not be for any longer. We must ensure that the history of this iconic aircraft and its role in both war and peace is not forgotten. This is particularly important on the West Coast because there is currently no Lancaster in any condition in British Columbia. Columbia, sorry. Whereas, as you know, there are four Lancasters in Ontario. Um, I would just like to say again that it would be an honor for our museum to display this amazing aircraft and to thank you again for allowing me to speak to you and I would welcome your questions. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions uh, for Ms. Lewis? Okay, seeing none. Uh, members? Um, Question of staff? Sorry, Councillor. Question of staff? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank so, you, um, Councillor On uh, page four, the staff report advises that uh, opportunities for the public to interact with Lancaster's exist in southern Ontario at museums in Hamilton, 
Ottawa and Trent, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ontario really has the benefit of having, at the present moment, four of the 17 complete Lancasters on the planet, um, one of which uh, is one of only two on the planet that fly out of Hamilton, the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. Um, Restoration work is also underway uh, at the National Air Force Museum in Trenton, uh, and the Canadian Aviation Museum in Ottawa also holds a Lancaster. Okay, so we're looking at a new City of Toronto Museum. Um, can anyone give any advice if any of the spaces being considered for that would be big enough to house this Lancaster? <clears throat> uh, we work with uh, Real Estate Division to uh, examine all the opportunities. There are no buildings that the city owns, <coughs> excuse me, where this could be displayed uh, here in the city of Toronto, nor are there any buildings that we're aware of that will be available in the future. And I'm referring specifically here to uh, Downsview, since that is owned by a, uh, a pension fund uh, group now uh, and is in under lease for three years. So. Uh, the prospects of a existing building being available for this is pretty low right now in the city of Toronto. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's obviously a lot of merit in the notion that we've not done well to honor uh, this particular aspect of our heritage. Um, however, the numbers suggest that we send this to British Columbia, which I actually don't have a problem with because it's actually a part of Canada. Um, so do we know anything that's in the works, either on a small scale, at, let's say, for example, Heritage Toronto, or on a larger scale from the federal government to better mark this <coughs> part of our history uh, in, a, in, the, in terms of aviation or World War II contribution? I don't have that information, and there's nothing specific that we're aware of uh, regarding the history of Lancasters and their construction in the Toronto area. Okay, and my last question is, um, would you be amenable to um, investigating some way to memorialize the Lancaster FM 104 in Coronation Park? Uh, happy to do that, Councillor. And we can also make sure we could also request that that kind of recognition uh, be included in the display uh, in BC or wherever it ends up. Great. So I'll be moving that at when we, time comes to speak. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Just to clarify, we can't guarantee the kind of recognition at this time because it needs to go through a variety of uh, parks policies and city policies on memorials. If the motion will reflect to, that. Happy to champion it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Frackadex. Councillor Grimes. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Williams. Um, I guess at the, the meeting we had, we sent this off uh, at the, the uh, group's request to, I guess, explore federal funding and um, they've met with you personally. Could you maybe tell us about those meetings and uh, was there any federal money that you saw coming? I'll committed? Start, I'll start and then I'll ask my colleague Wayne Reeves to finish. Um, we had uh, very positive meetings, very impressive meetings in terms of the passion and, and the uh, true commitment to, to the, the pursuit of, of recognizing the history and the importance uh, of the people that interacted with the building and flying and dying with, with Lancasters. Um, so that was very positive. Uh, we recognized the engineering capacity uh, of the FM 104 uh, group. Uh, the problems were down the road, as you've focused in the second part of your question, in terms of funding for museums. Our practical experience with federal and provincial programs is that eligibility uh, doesn't always translate or very rarely translate into full support. And the likelihood of this down the road uh, funding being available for this particular purpose is very difficult to to judge. I'm not going to say it's zero, uh, but it's uh, certainly going to be tough. There's a lot of competition. The city alone has other projects that would be in front of the same um, uh, funding sources. So that, that funding is, is uh, very difficult to put any kind of uh, confident prediction on. So you stand by your recommendation, recommendations here today? Very much so. Thank you. Those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Grimes. Anyone else? Okay, just a quick question for me, um, Mr. Williams. Recommendation three, uh, and perhaps Mr. Reeves, 
Uh, you say in recommendations three that should negotiations to transfer the Lancaster bomber to the uh, British Columbia Aviation Museum fail, Council approve the transfer of uh, FM 104 to Edenvale uh, Aviation Heritage Foundation for continued restoration and display on condition that should the foundation decide to deaccess the Lancaster bomber, it uh, keeps the FM 104 in the domain bubble and, and so on and offering it by donation back to the City of Toronto. I'm just wondering, um, you're saying that if negotiation fails, and it hasn't, but if were it were to fail, Edenvale could, in fact, restore the product, but yet we're not really recommending them. Right. I mean, clearly we're saying that both are, are uh, meet our criteria right. for, okay. for uh, assignment of the, uh, of the uh, uh, object. Um, we rank the BC1 higher. Uh, we don't expect, to be quite frank, we don't expect the negotiations to fail, right. but we don't want to come back to council, especially with, with the six month break. So we wanted to get a, a backup recommendation in case. So that's what that recommendation is attempting for. to address. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, to speak, Council Frakadakis. Yeah, I, am, I have a motion, and it's that uh, Council direct staff to investigate ways to memorialize the Lancaster bomber. Are you moving the items? Yeah, okay. and, and the rest of it, yes. Okay. Uh, but I was moving this one uh, as number four, I guess, of, of the other three. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's come out to speak um, about um, how important uh, this plane is to, to them, to their history, to their family's history. Um, and as staff have said, I mean, we have four of the 17 Lancasters are actually on display in Ontario. The, B the British Columbia Museum, I think it's called Aviation Museum, um, which has been in existence since 1985, um, would be the only museum in British Columbia that could actually interpret this and would be the only one out there. And there is a history and a connection with the uh, Lancaster FM 104 um, in British Columbia, so I, they have the money, they want to transport it, they want to display it, and we don't have a place for it, unfortunately, here in Toronto, um, based on what staff have told us. So I'm not really sure what else we can do, but I mean, it would be in a, worth, in a worthy place, um, and lots of people would visit it. So I think it, it's really, we don't have many other choices. Thank you, Councilor Frakadax. Councilor Kelly, speak. Oh, no oh, question, oh. We're going, okay, that's fine, go ahead. How, you, how do you define memorialize? Well, it, it, to somehow honor, it could be a plaque, it could be whatever, some way that is uh, significant. I'm not defining it, but it could be a plaque. I'm sure there is a plaque. I'd be surprised if there wasn't one already, but I, there's other ways. It might not just be a plaque, it could be other ways. Ways of I'm not trying to prescribe the outcome. I'm just saying, like, can please look at this. It okay, good. Any further, further? Okay. Anyone else to speak? Councilor Kelly, speak. Well, I'll tell you, uh, Chair, where I'm coming from on this. Uh, the first is uh, um, from a family perspective. My father enlisted in the RCAF uh, in the Second World War, and a few decades later, when I was chatting with him about his experience. Um, I asked him why he enlisted, and his response was, Hitler had to be stopped, and I wanted to be one of the uh, people who helped stop him. Uh, the second uh, perspective that I have is uh, Toronto is the center of the universe. Uh, and, you know, we should, uh, if there's any, or Canadians don't, uh, don't brag, but I think uh, given the, the growth of the city of Toronto over the past few decades, I think Torontonians should. But despite those two perspectives, I think there's a, a nut that, that has to be um, understood, and that's the costs of restoration, building uh, 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 the capital costs of building a museum, and then the operating costs uh, going forward after those two things have been accomplished. There's a fierce, I think, uh, Chair, you, uh, you mentioned this in your, uh, in your um, remarks or your question. There's a fierce competition for money out there. 
Uh, and I certainly became aware of that with respect to the community hub that we want to establish uh, in uh, Northwest Scarborough. And there are no guarantees that the money will be there. And given the other options of, of uh, looking at the Lancaster bomber, being exposed to its role in the Second World War and to the, the, uh, the men who were, were involved uh, right from training or through to Bomber Command. Um, given the opportunities to understand the history of the bomber, I think are already there in other places in Ontario. Uh, and we already have a commitment from an organization in British Columbia that has the experience and the, uh, uh, in doing this sort of thing, um, I would uh, move the, uh, the recommendations that are before us in uh, 31.3. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Anyone else to speak? Um, I'll just say a few words. Um, I want to thank all the speakers who have come to us this morning uh, to speak. And in fact, for some of you, it is your second time speaking on this particular issue. Um, I realize and recognize the importance and the emotional element that it relates to some speakers who have spoken on this particular issues about their family involvement and so on. And I think that is something that is important for us to recognize and to celebrate as well as to appreciate. Um, you know, Canada has a rich history in aviation and it, it, it seems to me that the demonstration that we are seeing here today by the number of people who are interested in this uh, particular um, airplane is actually very encouraging. Um, partly because there's a recognition that this particular plane has a rich history in terms of our past and our foundation, uh, partly because there is a recognition that there are so many people who are interested in offering their time and to effort to try to ensure that this particular piece of aviation history does not sit in a, you know, area where it's not um, accessible to the public. And I think that each and every one of us here at this committee um, we're provided with information and we have to use our judgment and we have to understand what the uh, requirements are and we have to determine which one of the options is more likely to succeed versus the others and so on. And so I appreciate having received this particular item. I will, if it's permissible by the folks who have presented this for me for Save the Lancaster, I'd like to put this as a no, no worries. Whoever's put, presented this to me, I don't know. Uh, whoever's presented this to me, I would love to post it in my office as part of our rich history with your permission. And so, okay, fair enough. I'll work with you on that one. Um, so this demonstrates our, certainly our, you know, recognition for our history, our love of the aviation that is taking place. And I think it would be a different discussion if we were shipping this to the U.S. or some other place, quite frankly. And as Council Frakadakis points out, that this is part of Canadian history being kept in Canada. And I think that's really important with respect to that recognition and so on. And while today, um, you know, one group will win versus the other based on the staff recommendation, we have to also, um, you know, and, and oftentimes it's a double-edged sword for us with staff. Sometimes we say we agree with staff, other times we say we don't agree with staff, but they are our professional staff. and. The information that uh, um, is prepared and the, the work with Mr. Reeves and Ms. Williams and others have done really has been very thoughtful and very helpful. There's been a lot of care and a lot of effort and, and to recognize the importance that people have with respect to this particular airplane. I believe that staff has given sufficient consideration. They have exercised good judgment in terms of assessing the information. And I believe that the recommendations that they have put forward is such that I can support uh, based on the criteria that they have in place. I want to just remind members that we did take the time and offer to defer the item for further discussions, for further information to be brought forward and so on, and to assess and determine whether or not 
the information that was provided to us it was sufficient enough to help in terms of you know, revisioning and re perhaps uh, changing our minds about the recommendations been provided. I see no information here today that causes me to believe that I should vote against the recommendations that have been moved by Council of Rakadakis and Kelly. And so for those particular reasons, I'm going to support the recommendations that are here. And I'm very proud of the fact that all the people that have come here today to talk to us about um, the Lancaster bomber in the fact that you've taken the time, the very passionate, but also the fact is this particular piece of Canadian history will continue to stay in Canada and we will be restored rather quickly as opposed to a more elongated period of time of uncertainty in terms of not only um, the resources, but also perhaps some of the ability of ensuring that the volunteer hours that would be needed for this particular restoration and so on would in fact be met. So. All those in favor of Councillor Frakadakis's um, uh, recommendation, a motion? Uh, it's not on my screen, but oh, okay, it's up. That's good. Um, all those in favor, opposed? It's an item as amended. All those in favor, opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. We are now, mo members, moving on to um, our next item, <coughs> which is uh, ED 31.7 Imagination, Manufacturing, Innovation, Technology. I'm at Property uh, Tax Incentive Program. My first speaker is uh, Peter Minkus. Mr. Minkus, would you come forward, please? Anna, Anna. And Mr. Minkus, you'll have, let me know when you're ready, sir. You'll have five minutes to speak. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And, uh, Chair uh, Councillor Thompson and, uh, and members of Council and City staff, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, make a deputation on behalf of Mencus 55 Lakeshore. So I'm here to speak to the report for action on the IMIT program and its recommended refusal. Hopefully you've all had a chance to go through our response to the uh, report. And I'm going to focus on three matters that have uh, of fundamental flaws to us. The first one, I'll quickly summarize, is the abuse of the process in processing the 100 Queen's Key IMED application. Secondly, the creation of an unfair competitive process, preferential treatment to a project at 440 Front Street. And as well, number three, the erroneous assumptions to conclude that 100 Queen's Key does not get awarded the IMED grant. So we applied for the IMED grant just over a year ago for this project. Council recommended changes to the program in April 2018, 10 months after our application. Staff did not process the application in a timely manner. The second item is an unfair competitive environment. I'll be specific to 440 Front Street to 100 Queens Key East. We are competing for the same tenants and by allowing 440 Front Street and not 100 Queens Key to receive the IMET, it prejudices our site and puts us in an inferior position to attract tenants. The rationale for the two sites is not accurate. There are many more office developments actually in the West Market that we listed in our letter. 100 Queens Key is the first private new office tower in this area since one Young Street was built in 1971. This is not the financial core and should not be part of the expanded core. Nevertheless, this should not be a factor in this study as our application predates the April 2018 report. Thirdly, most importantly, I think as well, is the Hempson report. It has many erroneous and arbitrary assumptions. The grant was a deciding factor for 100 Queensky East to be built. It is a small part of a large mixed-use project called Sugar Wharf. The LCBO made their decision to lease 180,000 square feet in Queens Key East based on the IMET grant. We would have not decided to build an additional 400,000 square feet on speculation without IMET. It, would, it is non-economic. We provided confidential information to Hempson showing how uneconomic it is without the IMET. We had every intention 
and expectation of receiving this IMET when we broke ground, we announced this project, we're well under construction, and quite honestly, to be to have this report come forward now, after the fact, when we've made major business decisions on this site and committed a lot of capital, really is unfair. The staff report claims that the Hemson report evaluated 100 Queen's Key under pre-existing rules, but then it contradicts itself by referring the expanded financial district, which is, which is an irrelevant statement if reviewing under the existing rules. The report says that rejecting 100 Queen's Key will help fund SmartTract, again, irrelevant, by the way, proposes a station, and which by the way, it proposes a station at 440, Smart Track proposes a station at 440 Front Street East, whereas 100 Queens Key has no transportation infrastructure, so really it's putting salt in the wound when we're trying to compete apples to apples and putting ourselves in an inferior position. So in conclusion, we ask city staff to reconsider the report, and the report which is to not provide IMET, grants to 100 Queens Key. Obviously, we want the report to support it. We've, based on the abuse of the process, based on delays, creating an unfair competitive environment, and the flaws in the rationale provided to staff in the Hemson report. We really feel, quite honestly, hard done by. We talk about, um, sell, you talk about EDC, talks about selling the city, and really, on a global perspective, if any other company saw us being treated like this that was trying to invest in Toronto, I honestly think that they would think twice about how the city would be treating their uh, people that invest within the community. And that completes my uh, deputation. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Menkes? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Rory McLeod from Cadillac Fair Fairview. Mr. McLeod, you have five minutes to speak, to, sir. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start your time. That's great. Thanks very much. I have a suspicion that some of these uh, comments will start to feel a little repetitive, so I'll uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, move through as quickly as I can. So check my watch here. I think it's still good morning, uh, councillors. Uh, as the introduction said, my name is Rory McLeod. Vice President of Development for Cadillac Fairview, and I'm responsible for uh, both 16 York Street and 160 Front Street, two projects with applications uh, before you uh, for the IMIT program. 160 Front Street has a project value of $833 million, 16 York Street, one for $479 million, both very substantial undertakings that will provide office space for thousands of workers, hundreds of construction jobs during construction, and will contribute millions of dollars annually to the city's tax base. Both of these projects um, are under development. Uh, we've made binding commitments to prospective tenants and look forward to delivering those buildings in 2020 and 2022, respectively. Uh, I'd say the IMET program is a long-standing and well-regarded tool uh, to encourage uh, new development in the City of Toronto. We appreciate that, <coughs> that the program uh, is now changing. That's not why we're here to talk today, but to talk about the program as it um, had existed under these applications. Uh, the application for 16 York was made almost a year ago uh, on August 9th and the application for 160 Front uh, earlier this spring. Uh, since then, we've been eagerly awaiting uh, consideration. Uh, I'd share uh, the previous deputant's uh, um, surprise to say that, uh, uh, that, that a refusal uh, was, I think, quite unexpected and we strongly disagree with the Hempson findings and the staff recommendation uh, before you and just like to make three points very quickly. Uh, one is is that the program is meaningful. I think there's a sense that um, uh, in some quarters that the pro project isn't uh, value or isn't valuable and isn't uh, determinative. Uh, in fact, it is. Um, the grants directly benefit the tenant, not the landlord community. Um, I can say without exaggeration that uh, without exception, every tenant over the last six years who has considered either of our buildings has raised the IMET as an important uh, component of their deliberations. They constantly seek uh, quantification of the benefit and assurances uh, that that will be received. On a number of occasions, that's involved meeting with Rebecca Condon and Mike Williams uh, at the city uh, to explore jointly with the tenants uh, participating uh, aspects of the program and, and certainly have appreciated Rebecca and Mike making themselves available uh, for those meetings uh, of which there's been many. The second comment is, is one of equity and I think you've heard it from the 
from Peter previously. Simply put, it's inequitable to have approved applications for so many of my competitors under the same criteria while somewhat arbitrarily denying uh, these two applications amongst others. The program has been characterized by city staff as having been uncontentious and enjoying wide support among councillors in the past. Each application under the program has been approved unanimously by this committee and in turn unanimously by council. A substantial number of office towers in downtown Toronto have been approved, 1 York, 88 Queens Key, 22 Adelaide, 18 York, 120 Bremner, 25 York, 100 Adelaide, 81 Bay, 141 Bay, among others, uh, and it was our reasonable expectation, having met all of the criteria, uh, that both CF projects would have been similarly awarded. On the basis of the foregoing, uh, I have tenants, who uh, one of whom I believe is here today and will speak, who have made binding commitments to lease in these two projects, uh, on the expectation that we would be awarded consistent with uh, not the majority, but literally everyone else. Um, denying these applications would mean I'm faced with the prospect of competing with buildings that enjoy a tax advantage while I do not. In the case of 440 Front, another application before you today, uh, which has been recommended for approval, it is less than 800 meters away from my building. And in the case of 81 Bay and 141 Bay, less than 300 meters away from the other. I compete directly with these projects and we chase the same tenants. And then the third uh, item has been raised uh, previously, both the Hempson report and staff reports seem to contradict each other by claiming simultaneously to be reviewing the project under the current guidelines, yet repeatedly offering as justification um, new program criteria that, oh well, they would be otherwise outside of the revised financial core going forward, uh, or offering extraneous um, commentary to justify refusal, particularly the but for uh, uh, and discussion around market conditions. Um, this all despite repeated assurances that the applications would be judged under the criteria as set out under the application. Um, a more timely consideration of our application perhaps would have avoided that uh, invalid comparison. Um, I'll just close on that and say, given the foregoing, uh, we would appreciate you um, approving the application of those two buildings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Um, our next speaker is uh, Peter Milligan uh, from Walker Longo LLP. Mr. Mc Good morning, sir. And Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Still morning by 30 seconds, I think. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, councillors. Uh, I'm here this morning uh, representing the interests of the Lic Liquor Control Board of Ontario. LCBO is a, uh, a tenant of the Menkes project, which you've heard uh, Peter Menkes speak. Uh, the LCBO, I think most of you realize, or if you don't, uh, since prohibition has been, to this day, the largest single buyer of beverage alcohol in the world. The LCBO corporate headquarters has been a significant presence on the Toronto waterfront for decades. The LCBO undertook a request uh, for proposal RFP process with a view to maintaining its corporate headquarters presence in Toronto along with a premier retail location. As part of the RFP process which, uh, in which LCBO sold the uh, property uh, to Menkes uh, and a leaseback, it was fundamental, it was expressly identified that the uh, IMIT grants would be part of the, negoti the negotiation with the successful proponent. The successful, pro the successful proponent, Menkes, in good faith, made an application under the under IMIT grant. And we fully support uh, the representations that were made a few minutes ago uh, by uh, Peter Menkes. The recommendation of staff to reject the application is based, we believe, on inappropriate criteria and financial grounds that are unrelated to the original intent of the IMET program. And it was done one year after the application was made, literally one year. The Hemson report clearly indicates in its criteria uh, at page three that the, uh, one, the 100 Queens Key clearly meets and exceeds all existing criteria under the program. 100, 100 Queens Key, by the way, is the only Brownfield site that has been rejected by your staff. And Brownfield is a fundamental element 
of the uh, IMIT program if you go back to the very genesis of it. The Hempson report uh, is fundamentally flawed in our view as well. While it identifies certain criteria, there is no meaningful measurement of the criteria in any way. Instead, what they do is they create an additional item called but for, which is not a criteria in the existing program. The Hempson report acknowledges that there isn't even a universally accepted concept of a but for test, but then, then translates it, if you will, into a so-called market, uh, broader market test. Hempson's concept of but for becomes not one of a number of criteria in our view, but it becomes the only criteria. The Hempson report also states that this, this particular development, 100 Queens Key, quote, would likely proceed uh, regardless of the criteria. What Hempson fails to consider in its analysis is that both LCBO and, and Menkes relied on the existing program criteria in reaching their respective decisions in the negotiation process. The Hempson report states that 100 Queens Key would likely be eligible for Britter grants. It's interesting that the city uh, com report, the report of city staff makes no reference to this. To read the city staff report itself, and I would ask you to do so regarding its description of the 100 Queens Key, uh, the, 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 you, one would think it would be approved. Simply the language and the tenor of it is such that one would suggest that the, uh, this application would have been approved. So in conclusion, the only rejected application, which is a significant brownfield site, is this property. This property meets and exceeds all stated criteria in the IMIT program at the date the application was made, July 4th, 2017. And that should be the only basis at this time for approval. The but for test as identified and applied by Hempson is restrictive, flawed, and should play no role in, the, in, in, the term, in, in, in assessing the, uh, uh, the uh, 100 Queens Key application. In our view, and the, on, on behalf of the LCBO, extraneous and un unrelated financial considerations identified in the staff report should play no part in applying criteria to the existing city grant program. As well, any reasonable weighing of criteria by Hempson or staff should have resulted in only one conclusion, and that is approval of 100 Queens Key. This committee should reconsider the staff recommendation on the above and approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Jamie Walker from Walker Longo LLP. Mr. Walker? Is Mr. Walker here? You're not speaking, okay. Please, if and there's anybody else who doesn't wish to speak, just let the clerk know, please, that'd be great, thank you. Uh, our next speaker then is uh, Fabian Marino. Mr. Marino, you come forward, please, sir. You have five minutes to speak, sir. Hello, my name is Fabian Marino. I'm the Vice President of uh, Industrial Affairs and uh, site head for the Sanofi Pasteur site in Toronto. On behalf of uh, our more than 1,500 employees, I would like to thank the city staff for their hard work and recommendation. I would also like to thank the committee for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak and for your support of our IMIT submission for our, our new vaccine manufacturing facility. The new facility will be located on a Connaught campus, which is north of the city, where we've been operating for more than uh, 104 years, 1914 uh, when we started. It's a large project for Sanofi. As a matter of fact, it's the largest project of its kind ever for Sanofi globally. It's of over a $550 million investment. When the facility is fully built, equipped, and validated, it will be able to uh, help us continue our uh, research, product development, and especially manufacturing um, in order to allow us to export to more than 80 countries. This will be a state-of-the-art, world-class facility right here in Toronto. As a result, highly skilled employment for more than 1,500 people, continuance of work for 600 to 800 contractors on any given day, and uh, the continuous training, the conti well, the continuous of training for uh, nearly uh, 100 co-op students every year. 
It also means that the project, uh, there'll be a significant uh, portion of, um, of the construction jobs and services will, be, uh, will occur in the GTA. It's also worthwhile noting that B100 will stand on land that once was uh, zone residential uh, for redevelopment and now is zoned employment, which uh, to my knowledge almost never happens. We have many partners to make this project a reality, including many suppliers, the provincial and the federal government. It would be an honor. And we hope that, the, if, uh, and we hope that the, the city can support us in, um, in uh, getting this uh, assignment application through. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Marino? Seeing none, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Toby Wu, Quadrial Realty or Property Group. Mr. Wu, I have you on my list twice. I'm just going to allow you to speak once. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me know when you're ready, sir, and then we could uh, proceed with your time. Okay. Good to go. Great. Go ahead, please, sir. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chairman, uh, members of council, members of the Economic um, Development Committee and city staff. Um, my name is Toby Wu. I'm the lead for uh, the development group within Quadrio, uh, who's the applicant for the Commerce Court 3 uh, project. That application was made uh, back in December of 2017. I'd like to uh, just kind of raise a, a few points that have already uh, been raised by some of the other applicants, so I'll, I'll keep it pretty pretty brief. Um, the, the first thing we would uh, like to outline is that under the current rules, Carm Score 3, uh, the application has met all the uh, eligible criteria under the existing IMIT program. Um, it meets all the overall objectives of the city's uh, land use and economic growth um, uh, goals based on the 2 million square foot uh, office. Um, addition and 12,000 plus jobs uh, to the city in terms of full-time uh, employment. Uh, also provides a very significant infrastructure uh, benefit to the city, uh, improved connectivity to the King Street Station, uh, very significant public realm improvements uh, to the Bay uh, King Street front frontages, um, a new 40,000 square foot glass pavilion at the corner of Bay and Wellenden, um, the public realm benefits alone add, adds up to about 120 million in, in incremental investments uh, and forms part of an overall billion dollar uh, revitalization of King and Bay, which is obviously a critical part of the financial core, but has largely been stagnant really since the, the late 80s. Um, as outlined by some of the other uh, uh, folks that spoke earlier, um, we also have concerns with respect to the framework uh, methodology in terms of the, the denial of Commerce Court's uh, application. Uh, specifically, uh, I think in respect to the but for test, which we believe was a test that did not um, reflect a correct application, as our application was not on the basis of a transformational project. Uh, even if the but for test was relevant for the assessment, we also uh, have issues with the, the consultant report, uh, the Hempson uh, study which we believe did not adequately uh, consider uh, the detailed information that we had provided. Um, and in, in particular, uh, the very significant infrastructure costs that Commerce Core 3 is, is um, putting forward related to an infill adaptive reuse of, of a site uh, in the, within the financial core, uh, which in many cases is a much harder hurdle uh, to, to overcome uh, versus more conventional greenfield sites uh, so south of the tracks. Uh, I share with the other uh, speakers that the, the application of, that, uh, of a general market strength test uh, is not an outline consideration uh, under the current IMIT policy and really should not be used as a, a rationale on the basis of, of denying the application as well. Um, thirdly, uh, we'd like to talk a bit about the decisions and recommendations being made here um, uh, in terms of putting Commerce Court 3 at a, a specific competitive disadvantage um, and represents an effectively uh, an unfair discrimination to the project. Um, in particular, uh, to the case of 45 and 145, 141 Bay, which is a project previously approved under the uh, current program, two blocks south of Commerce Court. Um, and the specific approval or the proposed approval of 440 uh, Front Street, uh, the well, which is just outside of the expanded financial core, 
And being the landlord, uh, current landlord of CIBC, when it made its decision to relocate from Commerce Court to um, 45141 Bay, I could tell you that the application of the IMIT program and the savings uh, from a tax standpoint was a specific consideration that they, they considered uh, as part of that move. Um, so really based on the rationale uh, I think provided, we really request the uh, Economic uh, Development Committee uh, recommend the approval of the IMIT program in respect to Commerce Court 3. Uh, filling which uh, we would like for the um, really the application to at least be reassessed based on the merits that have been clearly outlined um, in some of the materials that have been provided. Thank you. Deputy? Uh, I have one. Sure. You're here representing Oxford? No, Quadreal. I'm sorry? Quadreal. The address? Uh, it's uh, on on the um, on the application. It actually says 56 Young, which is a uh, b property that's owned by BCIMC and it's managed by Quadreal Property Group. The property itself is called Commerce Court. Commerce Court's civic address is 199 Bay Street. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, deputant is Ian Andres. From Goodman's, welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ian Andres. I have been extensively involved in numerous IMAT applications over the past 10 years. I've worked closely with Ms. Condon and other city staff to ensure the IMAT program functions properly and fulfills its, its objectives. Today, although our firm represents a number of the uh, landowners, I'm here on behalf of BAC Surface Inc., which is a Brookfield company, owner of the site on which the 32-story Bay Adelaide Centre North Tower is proposed to be constructed at 40 Temperance Street. This will be the third and final office building that will complete the Bay Adelaide complex. What's that address again? I'm sorry. 40 Temperance Street. Thank you. It's an important project to advance the city's economic development objectives for the downtown core. It proposes to add approximately 100, 850,000 square feet of new office space and 5,000 jobs in the heart of the financial district, as well as providing significant public realm benefits. Like the other major players in the industry, Brookfield is not in the business of constructing new buildings on spec. It requires leasing commitments in order to move forward. And in the case of the North Tower, it has found a tenant willing to occupy a significant amount of floor space for its corporate headquarters, a use which has deemed, been deemed eligible by city staff. A major component of this tenant's willingness to locate within the North Tower was the availability of the IMIC grant. It has implications for the rent the tenant's willing and able to commit to, which in turn has a direct impact on the viability of the project as a whole. If the project does not proceed, the city will not receive its share of the tax increment from the increased assessment of the North Tower property, which amounts to 40% of the overall increment over the term and 100% of the tax lift thereafter. Most importantly, there's no legal basis for the city to refuse the requested grant for this project. The current citywide CIP bylaw has been in effect for over five years. It lists a number of challenges within the bylaw itself facing the development of employment uses in Toronto and it contains objectives including helping Toronto reach its official plan employment target and its growth plan employment forecasts, promoting economic development and competitiveness, encouraging the establishment of key clusters of economic activity, among other objectives. The corporate headquarters proposed by our client for the Bay Adelaide North Tower clearly advances all of these objectives, as is noted in the staff report. The existing CIP was designed to achieve its objectives by imposing strict eligibility criteria on the types of users that would be able to receive grants. One such criteria is that office buildings are not eligible within the financial district, the existing financial district, except where they contain users within specifically defined sectors and categories. And to the extent that the decision under the current CIP was made in 2012, and to the extent it was premised on a but-for test, meaning that the development would not occur but for the, the grants, the decision inherent in the existing bylaw is that this test is satisfied wherever the eligibility criteria are met. There are two exceptions to this. One is for transformative projects, another is for tourism attractions, because those categories require the applicants to submit a business case study which expressly demonstrates why the financial assistance is actually required for the development to be economically viable. So for those two categories of projects, the city made a decision that the level of financial assistance that would be theoretically available warranted additional review and study. No such criteria was imposed and is imposed in the existing bylaw on office buildings or corporate headquarters, and that's a key point. This bylaw went through a full public process under the Planning Act, and it remains in effect today. 
Uh, as the staff report notes, IMED applications are assessed against the bylaw as it reads on the date the application is submitted. This is how the city has always processed these applications. And the staff report is clear that the corporate headquarters in the, in the Bay Adelaide North Tower for which Brookfield is seeking a development grant meets all of the eligibility criteria. Therefore, the eligibility criteria in the bylaw must be applied and the decision of whether or not to approve grants must be based on these criteria and not other outside motives. With respect, there's no basis upon which City Council can approve one eligible project while refusing another eligible project. This is called discrimination and it would be an illegal exercise of Council's discretion. The only reason CIP bylaws are exempt from the general anti-bonusing rule in the City of Toronto Act in the first place is because they place restrictions and controls on how the City can provide financial assistance. And this is exactly why subsection 28.7 of the Planning Act requires grants to be provided in conformity with the existing CIP bylaw. If Council was free to make any decision it wanted without regard to eligibility criteria set out in the bylaw, it would be operating outside of the, param the parameters of the statutory exception to the anti-bonusing rule and would therefore be making an unauthorized bonus. Finally, with respect, the analysis by Hempson uh, leading to their refusal recommendations is arbitrary, imprecise, it's far from transparent. There are no meaningful distinctions or distinguishing characteristics uh, provided in the report and therefore it's simply not appropriate to make a decision uh, of this magnitude based on subjective relative assessments without any robust analysis to back it up. In summary, Council has never refused an application under the IMIT program. It's not appropriate or lawful to refuse this application either. Our client is relying on the availability of these grants for its project to proceed and therefore we're respectfully asking that this committee recommend approval of the 40 temperance application to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Our next um, uh, speaker is Anne Benedetti, uh, Goodman's LLP. Good morning. Oh, actually, it's good afternoon now. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Anne Benedetti, as you've noted, from Goodman's LLP. Uh, we represent uh, the owners of 30 Bay and 60 Harbour Street, 30 Bay ORC Holdings, Inc., and CPPIB, 30 Bay Inc. Um, I will try not to be repetitive and will try to distill the key points of the arguments in regard to the IMIT application. Our clients have made application for an IMIT development grant for an office building, 60 story office building, an investment of over a billion dollars with 1.5 million square feet of gross floor area at 30 Bay and 60 Harbour. Uh, further to the Chair's report, uh, these entities are related to Oxford Properties Group and as you saw on that list, a number of Oxford Properties, 100 Adelaide, Water Park Place 2 have all benefited from the IMET program. Uh, they continue to invest in the city and the 30 Bay project again was listed and we would say clearly this is a program that is working. Uh, we've reviewed the staff report and recommendations of the Hemson Consulting Report and I will distill that down to key points, which we believe are the essence of why this project should be approved for its grant. First, there is one CIP bylaw applicable to this project. Application was made in accordance with that bylaw. And that's not uh, Oxford's opinion, that's staff's opinion as well. The Planning Act requires that financial assistance provided through a CIP by bylaw be provided in accordance with that bylaw. As clearly stated in the staff report and the included Hempson report, our client's application, and I'm quoting from page six of the Hempson report, meets the basic eligibility criteria of the CIP bylaw. And uh, to assist, this is an office building. It's in a location in a transit corridor it well exceeds the GFA of 5,000 meters squared. It's actually 1.5 million GFA, this is square feet. And it's over 80% office. And as I'll note, it is even noted in the Hemson report, 14,000 jobs. There is no discussion of a but-for test that is applicable to our client's IMET application. And I won't repeat what Mr. Andres has said, but if you're looking through the bylaw, the only place you're gonna find a but-for test is for transformative projects and tourist attraction grants. This is an office building application. Based on that, there is simply no basis to refuse the IMED application. As has been stated before, the city has never refused an IMED application that meets the eligibility criteria. 
And of course, as part of its business decision making, Oxford Properties Group has consistently worked with the city, with Ms. Condon and her team and this committee, with its tenants in regard to IMAT applications as part of its process for attack, attracting great tenants to the city. The IMAT program is authorized as a statutory exemption from anti-bonusing pursuant to the rules of the City of Toronto Act. To conclude, it must be applied fairly, consistently, transparently, and without discrimination. The 30 Bay and 6 Street Harbour application meets all of the eligibility criteria under the only applicable bylaw. A refusal of this IMAT application will result in a competitive disadvantage for our clients and tenants as our competitors have been granted the very grants under the CIP bylaw under the same eligibility criteria that are proposed to be refused to our clients. Further, refusing the IMIT grant based on inapplicable considerations, such as the application of a test that clearly does not apply, would result in an unfair, inconsistent and discriminatory outcome. For those reasons, we would request that the 30 Bay 60 Harbour application be approved. In the alternative, uh, the committee could send the matter back to staff, again with clear direction to evaluate the application based on the appropriate eligibility criteria without applying a test or assumptions that are not contained in the applicable CIP bylaw. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Benedetti? Okay, see none, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I move that we uh, complete the agenda. Oh, yes, Councillor Grimes. Uh, thank you. Members, Councillor Grimes moving motion that we complete the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. We will do so. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Longo, Walker Longo and Associate, as opposed to LLP. Uh, this is the same firm or is it's it? It's the same firm, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so you get to be the associate and then the other. We shorten it to call it just LLP. All right, fair enough. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Councillors, for the opportunity to present to you today. I represent a major financial services provider that is a prospective tenant at 16 York. And so my remarks are in tandem with those remarks made by Mr. McLeod of Cadillac Fairview that pertain to that building. The, uh, as the availability of the IMAC grant program was a major consideration for my client in looking at the opportunity to be a tenant of 16 York, the application for that uh, building was submitted in August of 2017, so basically a year ago, and well before Council's determination in April of this year to curtail the program as regards the financial district. With respect to the Hempson Review, I note that the authors set out the benefits of the proposed development at 16 York in that it will accommodate thousands of jobs, relocate corporate headquarters, further the growth of economic activity in the South Core, improve the built form and physical character of underutilized spaces, and support land use objectives for the financial district. These are found at the table and on page 16 of the report. Yet, on the pretext of an inadequately described and applied but for test, which has been pointed out by most of the speakers today, is not a stated criteria of the existing IMIT grant program, Hampson concludes that the IMIT grant is not recommended. With respect to this but for test, no meaningful weighting of factors is enunciated anywhere in the review or staff report. The conclusion that the grant application is recommended for refusal appears with no justification. Tellingly, Hempson notes that under the proposed amendments to the CIP bylaw, the project would no longer be eligible for grants. This is an apparent retroactive application of proposed new rules, rules which are not even in force yet, to rules that were actually in place at the time the application was made. Staff's report states quite rightly on the first page that the applications under review are being considered under the pre-existing rules. Yet, on the second page, the language that staff uses suggests that they are actually reviewing the applications in accordance with the proposed new rules. This, with the greatest of respect, does not constitute fairness, transparency, or consistency of treatment. Finally, I note that the staff's review of 16 York, the property that I'm speaking about, which is found at page 8, 
provides a summary of positive features of the development and the ways in which it will meet the objectives of the city. If one were to read that paragraph in isolation, one would think that 16 York was recommended for grant approval. The recommendation to refuse appears as a bolt out of the blue with no reasoned, detailed, or coherent reasons for rejection enunciated by either staff or Hempson. I therefore would respectfully request that the committee reject staff's recommendation and approve the IMIT grant application for 16 York and thank the committee for its time. Thank you very much, Mr. Longo, for your presentation. Are there any questions for Mr. Longo? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. Our next speaker, final according to my list, uh, is Hugh Clark, Allied Properties REIT. Mr. Clark, come forward, sir. You have uh, five minutes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to, uh, my name is Hugh Clark, I'm the VP of Development at Allied Properties REIT. Uh, I wanted to start off by thanking staff. Uh, I've been working with staff for uh, about six years now, our first project that we applied for the IMIT grant was 134 Peter, uh, which is our head office. Um, I just also wanted to thank uh, the, the committee for considering uh, the application uh, and uh, the staff um, recommendation to approve. Uh, I don't want to discredit uh, the appropriateness of any of uh, my colleagues' properties in the room. Uh, they have all of their reasons why they believe that they should have uh, the grant. Uh, we also feel uh, that we should have the grant, um, mostly because this is for the tenants. Uh, this is for office development in Toronto. Um, this is very important uh, for all of us in the room. I think you've heard the kind of the feelings that they've expressed. Um, we compete, sure, we compete against each other. But we also compete globally. We compete in North America. When tenants are trying to decide where they want to set up their head offices, where they want to expand, they look for these things. They look for financial incentives to, to, to guide their decision. Uh, it's very important to us. We want to make sure that Toronto stays strong. Uh, and it, it stays strong by its, the business that happens uh, whether it be in the downtown core or, as in the case of the well, outside of the core. Um, and it's, it's very important that they get these benefits. Um, it has to be understood that these benefits do go to the tenants. Uh, they don't go to the landlord. Um, and in particular, the new version where, with the, um, the TC credit uh, that was uh, removed previously. Um, we don't get these incentives. It is the tenants. Uh, and that translates into a better economy for Toronto uh, and a better economy for all. So I wanted to, again, thank staff uh, for working with us on this application uh, and would like to encourage you to support their recommendation with regards to the well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Are there any questions um, for the speaker, Mr. Clark? No, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, members, committee, um, I am going to now allow for questioning of staff. I would like to suggest that if there are matters that um, would veer into uh, a legal sphere that would um, uh, create um, a, a challenge as part of the questioning, I would ask that um, we would go into camera at that time. But prior to doing so, I'd like to ask if there are questions that we could ask in public for members. And if you think for a moment that it probably should be an in-camera motion or a question, we would move that motion to go in camera at the appropriate time. So, Mr. Mr. Grimes, Mr. recognize Chair, you. My intention is to move in camera for the other members of my committee. So I would maybe suggest that we go in camera first. What's that? Councilor Grimes, let me just hear Councilor Kelly. Councilor Kelly. I'd like to cut to the chase um, and approve um, 440 Front and 1755 Steeles Avenue West. Uh, and for the balance that have not been recommended, I think that there is a motion that um, would accommodate the arguments that we've heard today in a report that would be presented to uh, Council. 
So, Councillor Kelly, uh, with your um, uh, permission, um, what I'd like to do is if we could do the questioning first um, and then go into camera as Councillor Grimes is. Uh, I'm going to move a motion, Mr. Chairman, to go into camera. Councillor Grimes, let me yeah. just finish the point, please. So, um, let's do that first before we come to conclusions with respect to your recommendation. You are still entitled at the appropriate time to move those and we can deal with them as a committee, but I think we have a uh, number of items on the um, on the agenda as it relates to the items that are, people have spoken about. Um, so I don't want to, at this particular point, deal with just some and not all. So then I think maybe the best um, option for us now, as, as Councilor Grimes is suggesting, is that we do move to go into camera, and then we can, uh, obviously, once we're done there, we'll come back out. We can ask questions that are, um, non-in-camera questions. So did you want to ask your questions now, Councillor? Mr. Chair, if I may, I actually yes. have questions that are related to the documents that are not confidential, but right okay. before us, so Fair I enough. was we'll deal with those. I could ask my questions. Okay. And That's fine. So, okay, so Councillor Grimes, we're gonna deal with the, um, the questions that are non-in-camera questions, and then we can go in camera after, okay? Councillor Frackenaxis, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So on page four of the staff report, it advises, and it's a quote here, generally speaking, the total grants are equal to 60% of the increased municipal property taxes over the first 10 years after construction. However, the Hampson report says the grant is, quote, typically capped at 60% of the cumulative municipal tax increment increase for the new development over a 10-year period. So my question is, is the 20, is the 60% a cap, and therefore can the grant level be a, at a lower rate? I don't know the answer to that question. So um, we have never done that. We would need to study that. Is there anyone from finance staff that could answer that? So this is this is a this is a question as to whether we can vary the amount of grant. That's to uh, depend upon an interpretation of the CIP. It's a legal question that requires more study in my view, but Jasmine may want to add to it. Legal? Cap is 60%. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, cap is 60%. Okay, so for 440, Forty front. Do we have an estimate of the cost of the soil remediation and any related brownfield costs? Uh, just give us a second, please, Council. Not on hand. We don't. We can get that for you. Okay. Um, so Hemson was provided by the applicants uh, with sensitive information regarding the projects, including estimated capital costs, anticipated revenues and expenses, and in certain cases, their own pro forma analyses related to the projects. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so for 440 Front Street, Hempson's uh, but for test conclusion is that grants may be a deciding factor. Given the level of information provided to them, is that a strong enough case for allocating this grant given that we have a lot of demands on the public purse? In Hempson's view, yes. Okay, so the recommendation to planning and growth is to put on a $30 million cap that can that be done for an application we approve at this time? No. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, you're done? Are you finished with questions? Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Hart? Just a, a quick question. I uh, heard uh, from many of the deputants that the rules of the game changed after the applications were submitted. Just your comment on that. So we, as reported in the, as noted in this report, um, we, uh, we recommended to, and, it, and it's gonna be decided at the next council meeting, hopefully, what the new rules will be. But these, all these applications were received prior to the new rules being in place. And so uh, these projects were evaluated under the existing rules. One of those rules, which is that any project over 150 million has to be approved by council. So that's why we have taken a separate report to council on these eight applications. And it's that advice to council that you see in front of you and that Hempson was asked to provide information to. Okay, Councillor Hart, Councillor Kelly. 
you add up, if you added up all the square footage of the applicants uh, whose uh, submissions have been denied, um, would, it, uh, would that square footage um, be approximately 7 million square feet? More than that, I think it's 1.5, uh, 7. Yes, you know, your of, fast math is better than mine. Footage. It's approximately would, 7 million square feet. A lot of square footage, would you agree? Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kelly. Just a quick question to staff. Um, what's the benefit to the uh, tenant with respect to an IMIT grant being uh, provided to uh, the developer? So in every IMET application that we've approved, we've been told by the developer and by the tenant that the IMET grant is being passed through to the tenant. Have you had any um, indication that suggests that that has not been the case over a period uh, of time in the number We're of We're pretty certain that every single one has been passed through. Of the official IMET program, some of the uh, pilot projects prior to IMET being uh, decided upon in the late 2000s did in include the uh, developer getting the money, but that's not the case since IMET formally has been approved. You mentioned with respect to your, I believe it's Councillor Kelly or Councillor Frakadakis, you mentioned that um, any project that's over $100 million has to go for council approval. Did you? 150 make, million. 100, sorry, 150 million to, for council approval, is that correct? Correct. And have you always used a third party to evaluate that recommendation that goes to council? We've In had. In this case with the, the Hampson report? So we've had three three projects over 150 million come, two because of the rule of 150, one because of the rule on transformative projects. Only the project on transformative projects uh, had a third party review. And the third party review on that one, what was the uh, recommendation? To go ahead. I see. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sir, Councillor Graham, you have a question? Uh, Mike, was the but for test ever used in uh, evaluations before? So the but-for test has been used uh, when the project was first, uh, sorry, when the program was first approved by council, that was the mainstay of the approval of the program. And it was similarly when we reapproved it four years later, it was used very heavily in the transformative uh, review of the Ivanhoe Cambridge, now the CIBC Center. Uh, project. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. There's no further um, questions uh, in the public uh, at this time. Uh, Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to go in camera. Councillor, I, I can update you on the one answer I couldn't. Our, our, our information <laughs> indicates that the 440 Front Street is about a million dollars in uh, brownfield remediation. One million dollars. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Graham, you have a motion? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. The afternoon development committee meet in closed session to consider a matter relating to receiving advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right. So we'd like to ask that the room be cleared of uh, parties not privileged to be in the room as part of this discussion.
That's up to you. Okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, members, we are now obviously back uh, in public. Um, are there any additional questions for the public? Okay, well, I have a motion that uh, staff is just um, working on so as to deal with this particular item. And I'm just waiting for the clerk to uh, type up the motion. Um, will we still vote on Councillor Kelly as well? We have Councillor, no. we do no, like order. Yes. Just, okay, fair enough, okay. Councillor Kelly's motion, uh, we're going to do my motion f first, if that carries. That he moved to, sorry, sorry, what's that? Uh, he was suggesting there, um, Councillor, would you like to just take a look at it? Thank you. He didn't move it. He was uh, he was hoping that I'd move it for him. But and I'm going to move my motion instead. If that carries, then we vote. Okay. We'll just wait for the clerk to. Did anyone wish to speak on this uh, before I move my motion? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the motion is going on the screen now. Thank you. So the motion is that the general manager uh, that item be sent back, sent to city council with that recommendation, and that the general manager of economic development and culture reports directly to council on alternative options for those applicants refused uh, the imagination, manufacturing, manufacturing, innovation, and technology incentive. Councilor, you have a question? Sorry, so I was just wondering um, why why wouldn't we just approve um, recommendation one for 440 Front Street and 7, 7, 1755 Steels Avenue West here today since that is a recommendation to um, approve those uh, grants and uh, give some comfort to those people in the audience representing those people and those applicants um, versus sending it without recommendations. Sure. They, oh, sure. Thank we wouldn't you, want no. to send a message that we don't support those. The council, thank you very much. Um, the general manager has asked uh, uh, of economic development, he suggests that he would like just to have the whole um, report be sent back to him for consideration, and then that he will direct the report to council. If you'd like to basically take those out and make your own motion, you're, you're certainly entitled to do that. I know that's what I think Councillor Kelly was trying to do. Right, but I'm, again, yeah, not supporting that. That's fine. I'm just asking you about no, this No, 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 and, and I'm giving you that explanation yeah. in terms of the general manager as well as the acting um, EC, ECM has made that suggestion as well. Okay. All right. Anyone to speak? Okay. So, um, obviously, um, this is a issue of, of great importance to the 
uh, not only the speakers that are here today, but I think in general with respect to this particular program. Um, I realize that the Hemson report has uh, brought forward um, what uh, has been utilized to assist in terms of arriving at a decision here. I'm not comfortable with the decision that, uh, and the recommendation that's actually in front of us. Um, it was my understanding with respect to um, the discussion that had taken place with uh, several of the applicant and so on that this particular matter, because they had applied prior to us looking to changing the uh, IMET uh, program initiative and so on, that their application would more likely be directed to council with a recommendation that council approved. Now, council is the final arbitrator uh, with respect to these matters, and that's what the rules state. It uh, seems a little irregular in terms of how um, we are dealing with this particular matter at this time. It appears that, um, and I, through the questions that I did ask about with respect to utilization of a third party, uh, and if my memory serves me correctly, with respect to the general manager said, well, we've used it once, I think that's what you said, Mr. General Manager, in a transformative, a transformative process and so on. And, and so we've heard that there are, you know, at least application here where there's Brownfield involved, which was um, the intent of this uh, IMET program, and we're not necessarily approving it today. So I think that there's a need for a rethink on this. And so um, instead of approving uh, some and not uh, approving others and or to send some back just for reconsideration, I think it would be best to send the entire report back for further discussions and uh, with uh, the, the general manager, DCM, uh, legal and others. And I suspect that uh, there were probably other uh, others involved in a decision. And then to bring the matter to council for uh, council's approving at, approval at that time. Okay, so that's the intent of my motion. So, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. I'll sign off on this one for you. Members, we're now moving to uh, item number uh, ED 31.8, authority to receive funds to increase awareness and take up of uh, Canada learning bonds um, in Toronto. Uh, we had uh, one speaker that Mr. Moran, Derek Moran, is the speaker. I don't see him either. I'm going to call him three times, though. Uh, no, well, let me make sure that he's not here. Uh, Derek Moran? Derek Moran? Finally, Derek Moran. Mr. Moran is not here. So, Councillor Grimes, what say you? Okay, members, Councillor Grimes is moving the uh, staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. Madam Clerk, you've got that one. It just, Councilor Grimes has actually moved that. Okay, take your time. Mr. Moran, he did not, he's not here. I called his name out. Actually, four. <laughs> Sorry. And okay, we have, um, yeah, we have item number 10, and I don't know if whether or not Councilor Cressy is going to come in to speak to this issue. It was a communication we had from C Councilor Cressy. I did speak with Councilor Cressy and mentioned to him that we were just going to broaden the area to include the, uh, the entertainment district. He did agree that he supported that, and so that was not um, uh, dramatically alter what his intents are. And I'm just looking to see if the door is actually opening and Councilor Cressy is actually walking in. But I don't see the door opening and Councilor Cressy is not walking in. I'm going to try to speak for another 30 seconds or so to see if he does walk in. Um, but um, the motion that's actually in front of the screen, maybe I'll just ask the clerk to put it on the screen. Uh, the initial intent of Councillor um, Cressy's um, uh, letter was simply to focus on the design as part of the new pedestrian. Oh, there he is. Councillor yeah, Cressy, come on in. You uh, can speak to this issue. So it's. Um, yeah, I think we have, um, sorry, this is, let me just take a look at, maybe, Councillor Cressy, I'll just have you maybe, uh, because you're a visiting member, just to speak to this issue, give me a moment to take a look at the things I have and the things you have to see if we can kind of make a happy marriage so that we can actually deal with this issue. Okay, take a moment. You bet, and, th and thank you, Chair, and thank you. 
Thank you for speaking slowly for 10 seconds there as I caught my breath from sprinting from my office. Uh, the background very briefly here is we've had Canada's Walk of Fame for more than 20 years in the country located in the city. Uh, and it's, it's been a centerpiece which has succeeded, uh, though in recent years the organization, Canada's Walk of Fame, has been looking for ways to revitalize and enhance their presence going forward. Uh, to revitalize and enhance their presence, not just from a physical built form perspective of the location and the style of the in pavement markings, but also who and how they recognize people. This year, for example, coming up, they'll be recognizing not just celebrated artists and celebrities, but also celebrated Canadians who've done work, great work in the fields of science of education, of health, and others. Uh, the background which pre, uh, predated the letter I've brought forward today is that Canada's Walk of Fame reached out to myself and, and Chair Thompson uh, to approach us about how they could partner with the city to further enhance and revitalize uh, their work going forward. Uh, they brought forward one concept which was perhaps to incorporate uh, their Walk of Fame into the John Street Cultural Corridor, a $50 million funded, fully funded uh, City of Toronto initiative that just broke ground uh, as one option. Uh, they've also been in conversations, as have we, with the Entertainment District BIA to say, let's look at John Street, but let's make sure we consider the broader Entertainment District as well. And I understand that Councillor Thompson uh, has an amendment to that effect. Uh, which is to look at John Street as well as the broader entertainment district. And so uh, at this point, the request is to initiate that work in partnership with staff. So for our tremendous staff to begin discussions with the Walk of Fame to see where and how do we best partner with the Walk of Fame. And by partner, I mean to help facilitate this. They've been very clear that when it comes to resources that uh, if and may be required, they are looking to leverage their fundraising capacity to make that happen. And so to me, this is a, an important first step to show our desire to continue to collaborate alongside Canada's Walk of Fame. Um, and I thank uh, our chair, um, Councillor Thompson, for allowing me to spend a few minutes on it, and as well for being a real champion on this, uh, as we've previously discussed this, and I understand he has a, a very helpful amendment, which I think will help to clarify this. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cressy. Um, good, Councillor Cressy, I have a motion here which is um, similar to what you want. I, I just just put in, in my discussion with the general manager, including potentially the revitalization, uh, revitalized space, public space on the southeast corner of King and John, right, as opposed to just simply King and John. So it gives them that broader latitude to be able to do that. Right. So if that's uh, in, if that's uh, clear to members, then we could actually uh, move that uh, and move that forward. Okay, so uh, the motion's on the screen. It uh, basically uh, captures what Councillor Cressy was asking for, captures what the folks from Walk of Fame. Uh, Ms. Solomon has expressed an interest as well, and this also captures that with respect to the entertainment um, BIA. So all those in favor, pose that's carried. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, we're done. Motion to adjourn. We do have. What do we have left? Business. Okay, that's good. Uh, all business has been concluded. I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, Councilor Akadakis. Um, all those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much to the clerk for the great work. Thanks. Let's sign this. Yes. Uh, and I have hmm?